This is one that we have audience interest in. Okay, uh, I would like to bring the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, March 12th uh, into session. And I'm going to begin with a couple of announcements about upcoming events. On Monday, March 18th at 6 p.m. in Honeyman Hall of the Main Library, the Brookline Commission for Women will be honoring Rita McNally, who is the uh, chair, interim chair of the Human Relations Commission, as the 200, two, sorry, 2013 Woman of the Year, and as well as recognizing student essay contest winners. So that's on Monday the 18th. On Thursday, March 21st at 6.30 p.m. at the Coolidge Corner Branch Library, authors of the Cultural Landscape Report for the Kennedy National Historic Site on Beale Street will be presenting their report, which chronicles the development of the Coolidge Corner neighborhood over the 20th century. And on Sunday, March 24th, the Brookline Historical Society Spring Program will be held at the former Free Hospital for Women on, at 60 Glen Road with presentations on the history and contributions of the hospital. This will be from, uh, actually, they're doing double sessions. I gather their uh, space at the free hospital is limited. So there'll be a, a 12.30 session and a 2 p.m. session. And reserva reservations are recommended. And I believe you call the Historical Society in order to make reservations. Any other, yes, in daily. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that people may have noticed that the, uh, library gala that we all enjoy every yes. year and which is a major fundraiser for the the foundation associated with the library they're not holding the gala this year but they do have uh, several runners in the marathon under the team brookline um, concept and um, I, they, I think they're asking people who might ordinarily go to the gala and and provide some support for the library to um, support these runners well, in a fairness, Selectman Daly, you missed our presentation oh. on Team Brookline last Tuesday. Sorry, sorry. And I think in fairness, we ought to mention that the other uh, uh, eligible um, people who have runners in uh, the marathon on Team Brookline are the Brookline Community Mental Health Agency, um, the Brookline Teen Center, and the Brookline Education Foundation. All of them are sponsoring runners, and each runner is obliged to raise $5,000, so it's a big challenge, and we hope everybody will get behind Team Brookline and support this uh, effort. Other comments or events? Selectman Goldstein. Thank you. I want to mention that on March 4th, uh, I attended, along with uh, over 100 of our representatives of our uh, liquor and food licensees, a uh, seminar on liquor, liquor compliance. Uh, this was the first first time, and probably the first of, of, of several, um, uh, first time event for, for the town. We had a uh, a expert um, uh, consultant on liquor law compliance, a gentleman by the name of James Staples with JBS Professional Services, come and present to all of our liquor licensees uh, a, a complete rundown of compliance with ABCC regulation and with the town's own uh, bylaws regarding, regarding liquor licensing. This is something that we're especially concerned with because we care about uh, there are two main issues. We care about not over-serving uh, pa patients who have already, uh, patients, <laughs> patrons who patrons? have already had, uh, t t we hope that they don't become patients in fact. <laughs> Uh, patrons who have already had enough to drink, but in e we are equally concerned with the service of underage patrons uh, in our very much uh, college infiltrated community. So uh, you you'll remember a few weeks ago we had a, a the Brookline police conducted a sting operation, and unfortunately we had um, a few th that failed that sting. We want to stop that. We want the next sting operation, to, we want the report that there was 100% compliance, and I think that that is a, a reasonable expectation. And so to do that, we, we're going we're gonna to make sure that our, our, our licensees are, are completely informed on what their responsibilities are, not just the, the carding of, uh, of potentially underage patients. <laughs> Here I go again. How uh, about customers? Can you do customers? customers <laughs> but also um, <laughs> 
compliance with the with the uh, record keeping requirements and tip certification and having alternate managers all of these points were driven home that night and uh, the re re reception was very favorable as I said there were uh, um, 92 licensees who were invited to attend of those 65 uh, licensees were, were represented and several had more than one person in attendance and that's how we got over a hundred um, uh, Police Chief O'Leary uh, spoke to the to the to the crowd uh, there. I spoke to the crowd there, and reinforced to them how important uh, restaurants are to our uh, to our community, and uh, both as, as an enjoyable place to to eat and drink, but also because it's it's key to our economic development, and. Um, and uh, positive feedback was had. We have a special shout out to a, a gentleman uh, from the Baker School, an eighth grader named Jake oh, yes. Queen, who right. was responsible for the AV in, at that session. And I got to tell you, we ought to get him here at Selectman's <laughs> meeting. It went perfectly. The uh, the AV pre presentation was absolutely uh, perfect. So. Right. I think it's wonderful to know that we have eighth graders who are able to intervene and get our IT systems up and running. So that's nice to know. OK. Um, other announcements for members of the board? Then uh, I propose that we review the minutes from March 5th. Any corrections or additions from members of the board? I do have a few. I'm going to pass Okay, over. if you pass that in. As do I. Then I move that we approve the minutes from March 5th as amended. All in favor, please say aye. And I'm skipping select. Are you going to be abstain. abstaining? Selectman Daly is abstaining. Um, Selectman Binka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Chair votes aye. And we'll move to our miscellaneous items. The first one is extra work order, storm response. We trees. have us. Yeah, it's trees. Is this the commissioner? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Gallantine. Looking over there at Mr. Papa Sturgeon, thinking he was going to be the speak spokesperson. Okay, so tell us about the Good evening. tree work. Sure. So um, this is an extra work order for Lewis Tree Service, and um, the bulk of it, 101,000, is for the response to Hurricane Sandy, um, and an additional 20,000 is for removals associated um, with uh, that. Uh, we also have about $15,000 that is for our forestry response and services during the blizzard. And the remaining is for um, some landscape service, meaning pruning work in the cemetery, um, some pruning work in the parks, and uh, the last bit is for work on the hemlocks uh, in Deep Lakely Horse Sanctuary. Will we be uh, eligible um, if we were to get um, emergency um, funding from the storm? Would any of this be covered by that? The um, Superstorm Sandy was not, um, so we wouldn't be eligible uh, where we were with Irene last I year. Okay. But um, depending on what happens with the blizzard, um, we have submitted our costs. Okay. And I guess because this is a big number and I assume not part of what you would have normally planned for, is this creating uh, any significant um, difficulties for you finishing through the fiscal year? No, I, this, this in essence will bring us through the end of the fiscal year for um, the work associated with the storms. Um, the reserve fund transfer was approved by the board and by the advisory committee, and that is really going to cover the bulk okay. of this. Good. Other questions? Yes. Selectman Binka. Thank you. Uh, what is the hemlock tree work? Uh, is this woolly adelgid it, it tree, is are taking trees down we are we've had or, a few or, that have um, succumbed because of the hemlock woolly adelgid we've been watching um, that we had um, some years where I want to say maybe five or six years ago where it was very active um, we had a couple years um, with very cold winters where we saw a decrease in activity um, but we did have some um, that needed required rec removal um, this year and do we you know we've We've got hemlocks on our property, and it's a small enough number and, and in size that uh, you can spray. I assume that we don't spray? 
We do some select spraying with Dorman oil. Where do we so do that? So we have a, um, a hemlock hell hedge at the um, Walnut Hills Cemetery that okay. we spray each year. And then we um, treat, we do stem injections in sort of significant healthy hemlocks at um, both at the top of Lars and in the Deep Blakely Horse Sanctuary. And frankly, we've seen some success with that. Really? Okay. Uh, and then there's the large hemlock stand near the Hammond Street fire station? Correct. Um, that, uh, that is um, we're, on the, we're on the golf to, course property. Right. right. Leaving to nature? Right now we're leaving to nature. Um, there have been a couple instances where uh, I think they had one significant one that, that failed and was a hazard and we helped um, bring that down safely. But otherwise, uh, we are, we're leaving that, leaving that to nature at this point. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then I move that we approve extra work order number three in the amount of $170,209.23 for work performed by Lewis Tree Services, um, upkeep of trees and related work. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. And I'm guessing you are not doing the next one, which has to do with, oh, what, maybe you are. I am. School grounds. I am. Yes, school I grounds. have a couple here. School grounds. Gotcha. So um, this is an extra it work It says snow removal, and I just don't associate it. I know. <laughs> I know. But we are, um, frankly, an important part of yes. the snow removal operation for the Department of Public Works. We help with um, both snow removal on the, on the public rights of ways, but also around all the town and school grounds um, as the water and sewer division um, helps us with that as well. And then uh, clearly around and through the parks. So every year we have a line item in our school grounds contract to help with removal of snow around the schools. Um, we have exhausted all of that funding. Um, and frankly, all of that was um, during and following the blizzard. And so this extra work order in the amount of $15,000 um, is to um, pay for the time in essence, that we use to clear the schools following the blizzard. Okay. Questions for Ms. Galantine? Seeing none, I move that we approve extra work order number two in the amount of $15,000 for work performed by D. Muzzioli Associates in connection with contract number PW11-02. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Chair votes aye. And I note that Selectman Goldstein is absent. <laughs> Okay. Would you like to vote on this? I shall abstain. Okay. So you may abstain. Um, item D, I believe, is Commissioner Papasturgeon. No, I'll take that well, one, too. You're going to do that one, too? Uh, sure. Right. Why not? He looks <laughs> comfortable back there. <laughs> <laughs> then maybe he can go home. Yeah, he, he may want to. But um, what, what this is, is this is an extra work order. Um, a s why, don't, why don't we do E right away? Yeah, and yeah, then Ms. Galantine there. can go yeah, home. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I miss her. It's okay. Miss go, her. go right ahead. We'll take up the next one, which is the emerald necklace. Okay. Uh, All right. My, you are my right. apologies. It's, it's your item. Um, okay. So this is an extra work order associated with um, work for the Emerald Necklace Bike and Pedestrian Crossing. Uh, this is all associated with phase one of the work. Um, the extra work order specifically was for additional traffic analysis and modeling, um, exploring various ramp closures and possible Im impacts at intersections that were outside the original scope of work. Um, this extra work order is fully funded by a Department of Conservation and Recreation grant. Okay. Questions for Ms. Galantine? Yes, Selectman Daly. No, I just want to say if you were, people are hearing from the public on the closure of Netherlands Road or the, the change on Netherlands Road, please, please let us know. I would love to come and we, we give you my have, opinion. Uh, do we oh. have a date scheduled for so the presentation? It, yeah, it looks as though... Um, the Department of Public Works will be coming back to the board on Wednesday, March 27th, 27th yeah. right, 27th. And um, frankly, we got a, a right. lot of feedback from you the last time we were here. We have subsequently met um, and did a full review with the Transportation Board. Um, I met with the um, head of MASCO and reviewed the plans. We have um, something in writing from them, also with EDAB, and then we made clarifications as well to the, um, the report as requested. But 
our intent when we come back is to present um, the Route 9 project only. And I think that was something that was a recommendation actually from this board. So that's what we'll present when, when we come back. Okay. All right. Any other questions? No. Nope. Seeing and hearing none, I move that we approve extra work order number one in the amount of $25,131.24 for work performed by Greenman Peterson, Inc. in connection with phase one report for the Emerald Necklace Bicycle and Pedestrian Crossing. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Ms. Gallantine. Now, Commissioner Papasturgeon. <laughs> All right. Uh, I believe we now have a um, revised and agreed upon language for historic street signs. I think we do. Uh, I'd like to thank Selectman Benka for drafting this language. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's particularly to the point. It's the direction that we've been looking for for some time now, I think, from the board so that we can move off the dime with this issue. And uh, as a result of the World Tech Engineer and Inventory contract that you <coughs> voted uh, last week, uh, I think that the outcome with this particular policy vote is uh, a good direction for us. So uh, I'm totally supportive of it. Uh, uh, the language is something that we can certainly live with. I know the Preservation Commission has weighed in on it as well. And uh, we seek your approval. Okay, questions? Slightman Daly, you were not here, but I guess we could I, I <coughs> remind you that we everything. did vote um, some conditions to the uh, inventory that protected the historic signs and separated that out or separated this portion out which was really more policy and actually it's Selectman Benka who's drafted this so I I should allow him the speech on what we're doing here and why well thank you the um, uh, the the issue of the historic street signs has been one that has been uh, lingering for a number of years and um, uh, with uh, the cooperation of uh, DPW and Commissioner Papasturgeon, um, we've uh, basically put together a policy that defines, um, and also uh, with the cooperation of the Preservation Commission and their staff, um, we've uh, put together a policy that defines a direction for the future uh, with regard to those signs. Um, there uh, has been, um, a uh, change in the Federal Register uh, that deals with uh, locally recognized historic districts uh, that basically uh, permits those signs to remain uh, without uh, compliance with uh, MUTCD um, uh, guidelines or standards. And uh, this uh, proposed vote um, makes a determination that there are such locally recognized historic districts in the town and uh, deals with signs in those districts and, and the historic signs generally throughout the town. So uh, if you'd like, I can read the vote. Uh, oh, why not? And um, Well, can I ask a question, though? Sure. sure. Okay, so I'm, I'm concerned about the, so the historic signs that are not in local historic districts. So can you explain to me how, how they are protected this, through this? This vote, um, this, first of all, the term locally recognized historic district um, is defined in the Federal Register as um, districts that comply with certain federal standards. They don't have to be local historic districts. Voted, under, under, voted local historic districts. Right, under, our, under Chapter 40C of, of the Mass General Laws. So this actually uses the term locally recognized historic district more broadly to include local historic districts, neighborhood conservation districts, national register districts, or national register eligible districts as determined by the Preservation Commission. Signs within those districts are protected under the Federal Register. Under this policy, let's take um, signs that are not in any of those districts. This policy uh, states that those, those signs should be preserved and if necessary, supplemented by MUTCD signs, rather than those signs being torn down and replaced by MUTCD qualified signs. So 
this policy would preserve the signs, the historic cast aluminum street signs throughout the town. Where there is not a waiver under federal law, um, it, uh, it says still preserve those signs and supplement them with the federally mandated signs. And I think maybe there's another term of art here, is that correct? They're going to be maintained as, quote, historic objects. Right. Okay, because I'll just say in my neighborhood, we have some of the historic signs. People, uh, you know, read them. I, I don't think we want a second set of signs right. uh, necessarily. Nor, We're happy nor do you want our, those torn down. Right. We, want, we like them the way they are. That, that's uh, my question, too. Um, arguably, the only thing worse than losing our historic signs would be having to crowd our poles with two identical signs. I'm not sure that that's worse, but it's arguably worse. Um, what, what are the chances that we might still have to do that? Well, the, the vote says they're supplemented as required by signs meeting MUTCD standards. Um, uh, uh, Andy, you can respond to this. My understanding is that there is really no sign policeman in the state, um, so it may never be required that anything is supplemented. Well, I'll, I'll get to what I'm wondering about, is do we need some kind of vote of town meeting um, so that if the MUTCD people looking at these say, okay, it doesn't meet their regulations, but we have some kind of vote of town meeting that the, these are historic and... It's not required. Okay. I don't... All right. Uh, yeah. We, we don't we do need it. it we do it. We designate uh, them as historic objects as the uh, executive body of the town. Okay. Um, and I think um, uh, the issue, uh, whether it's a vote of this board or a vote of town meeting, would be whether uh, federal requirements um, uh, require action to be taken. And um, within the limits of uh, the recently published waiver uh, in the Federal Register, um, we're going to the, um, uh, to, to the extent allowed under that to protect the historic signs. Okay. And just one other comment. Um, we were concerned, and I think we have now placed conditions on the contract plus this policy that will protect the fact that the historic signs can be listed in the inventory with some sort of special designation to be figured out by the people who are doing the inventory, but we'll then know where they are and the inventory actually will identify them by condition, but they will also be exempt from MUTC. So for the first time, we'll actually have a pretty reliable list of where they are and what condition they're in. And I think Commissioner Papasturgeon is particularly pleased that he'll know where they are and that will kind of give us guidance as we go forward in the future. Okay. Yes, this is in addition to the inventory that we now have at the Municipal Service Center on signs that have been removed from service. Okay. Can, can I ask one, one more question? So the, to me, the, the most poignant sentence in this is the last sentence of paragraph two, historic signs shall not be evaluated with respect to any MUTCD standards applicable to other signs. Can, can you give me the, the background of that sentence a little bit? Like what, what, what would happen if we did evaluate them? And conversely, is there, is there a mandate that we're not obeying by refusing to, to no. evaluate? The, um, uh, the, the, I, I think um, the, uh, was it Senator Kerry's office? Yes. That was very much involved in this. Um, Brookline and uh, a number of other communities. Lower with, Marion Township outside of Philadelphia, among others. Lower Marion Township outside of Philadelphia, <laughs> among others. Um, uh, also, uh, a, n a number of communities that also have signs like this raise the issue of um, the revisions to the Federal Register and the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices that basically uh, would have made these historic signs and other similar signs non-compliant. They would be non-compliant, for example, with regard to reflectivity, uh, a big issue. Um, 
the uh, exemption for signs in locally recognized historic districts uh, essentially says that the historic street signs do not have to comply. Uh, and therefore, we adopt that and say that the signs will not be evaluated with regard to MUTCD standards. <clears throat> If this we, is if we did evaluate them, we're sure that they would probably they would yeah they would, that's they, they would, they that's they what I yes heard for years so, they would not pass so but it, does the act of evaluating them and and having them fail are we afraid that 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 moves them along in a, on a regulatory basis towards towards their prohibition I, I think that's why I we want know. historic by them instead of an evaluation that they would fail. But, but the goal was to, in effect, keep the DPW and the commissioner out of conflict with the manual that says thou shalt. And what we're trying to do here is provide a clear policy from the Board of Selectmen for the town of Brookline. We want our historic signs to be protected and not fall into the category that might um, somehow inadvertently declare them ineligible and they have to be replaced. Now, the, the federal, can the Federal Register exemption uh, has a sentence in it to the effect that the sign should be legible and uh, um, useful? It's reflective, I think, is the big deal. <clears throat> yeah. So, and our, and our signs certainly do comply with that uh, generally broad directive that the, that the signs have to be useful as uh, informational signs. Um, it's, I think, primarily the reflectivity issue. Um, I, the sign size may be uh, an issue also. They're slightly smaller than the, um, I believe they're slightly smaller than the uh, MUTCD standards, but they are certainly uh, legible and useful, and people have been finding their way around with these signs for uh, decades already. Or not. I'm not saying people don't get lost in their neighborhood. No, it's not the fault of the signs. Oh, come on. Now everybody goes around with their little electronic device, so nobody gets lost anymore. All right. Are we, are we ready to go ahead? Yep. Um, so. Not clear anymore that we need to read out this language in detail, um, but if you'd like to, I certainly um, would be happy. Um, why, don't, why don't I summarize? Sure. Um, can, can I add one can I make one change? Sure. Uh, and number three, existing historic signs in all locally recognized historic districts shall be retained and maintained. And historic signs outside of any such districts shall be designated in this study as historic and maintained as historic objects? The, did, did we do that with Yeah, the, actually, um, the vote last week it with it, um, with on the oh, contract okay. um, required that. Okay. Required that they be designated and identified. Okay. So. All right. Ready to go? Yep. All right. You going to summarize? Sure. <laughs> uh, so we are uh, designating, um, as I said, uh, local historic districts already designated, neighborhood conservation districts, National Register, and National Register eligible districts as, um, quote, locally recognized historic districts, which is a term of art. Uh, within uh, the um, manual on uniform traffic control devices and within the language of the Federal Register. Um, the World Tech Engineering Survey that we voted last week um, will be the basis for the maintenance and, where applicable, the restoration and replacement of such historic signs in such locally recognized historic districts. Signs in local historic districts will be subject in all respects to Preservation Commission LHD guidelines, including restoration, and in neighborhood conservation districts to NCD guidelines. Um, existing historic signs in all locally recognized historic districts, as that term is used in the federal register shall be retained and maintained and historic signs outside of any such districts shall be maintained as historic objects subject to any non-reparable losses and supplemented as may be required by signs meeting MUTCD standards. And finally, um, the vote notes that the Department of Public Works will 
uh, complete the updating of the 2006 cast aluminum street sign inventory and that inventory of signs that are now at the Municipal Service Center uh, will be combined with the results of the <coughs> inventory of signs that are out in the field on the street now being done by World Tech Engineering and those results will be um, used in implementing this policy regarding the maintenance, restoration, and replacement of historic signs. Okay, I think we can take a vote now. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. aye. Thank you, Commissioner. There's a comment. And, pardon? Oh, you have a question? Uh, sure. R Rob Daves, um, uh, town meeting member from Precinct 5 and also on the High Street Hill Association. In 2001, uh, I met with uh, Selectman Joe Geller, Roger Reed from the Preservation Commission, and our former DPW commissioner. And I thought at that time we had an agreement to save these signs, but little by little, you know, because of attrition and other means, they were, um, the, the numbers were lost. And so it's very gratifying to hear that this step has been made. And it's taken the a long time. Twelve years. Twelve years, mm -hmm. and Senator Kerry got involved, and um, Dennis wrote a nice report that kind of brought the history together. Dennis is Dennis DeWitt. Dennis <laughs> DeWitt, yes, yeah, sorry. And uh, anyway, it's, it's 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 very exciting because I think they are extremely special, and it reminds us that we are in Brookline when uh, when you cross into our border. There, um, it's it's special. But we we look forward to hearing. Uh, the means of replacement for the ones that are lost and helping in any way that we can. And and we do understand that um, there are vendors who can repl yes, replicate course. our historic signs and that there will be a way of establishing, so to speak, uh, we'll have to go through an RFP process of some sort, but there will be a way of establishing a relationship in order to be able to have uh, replacements made. The, the High Street Hill uh, two years ago did its own photographic inventory of our own signs. So if that's of any help for something that might have been lost. You can talk to the commissioner. He's still in the back of the room. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on to the next item on our calendar, we have a candidate for Human Relations Youth Resources Commission, Mr. Sanabria. Yes, right if you would come to the microphone, please. Absolutely. Welcome. Evening. So tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in the Human Relations Youth Resources Commission. My name is Cruz Sanabria. I'm a resident of Brookline and I'm a teacher, disabled veteran, wounded in action. I, um, as you can see, am a Hispanic. Puerto Rican, who grew up in Spanish Harlem and moved to Brookline 30-some um, years ago, in and out. Um, my children went to school in Brookline, and I'm interested in basically working with the Human Relations um, Commission that deals with diversity, discrimination, and inclusion. And being a minority member of Brookline and, and, be, and attending these meetings, I basically see in an, a role, a part that I can play in um, the policy gearing, uh, uh, the policies that are, have been implemented in Brookline for many years that haven't totally been utilize um, having experienced discrimination and racism, I think it's important that since that is what the commission is about, that they do have more people of color and people that are minorities in community. It's interesting because I work in Roxbury and I teach there and over there I advocate having more Irish teachers <laughs> and having more of a white community so that the students are exposed to their neighbors, as I call them. Um, that being said, um, I am serious about um, making a difference and having an impact 
in this commission that has uh, been moving along in the right direction. Uh, so I have been attending the meetings and um, what else? I can say a lot of things, but I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> okay. Um, and I, I do have the impression that you, you said that you've been attending meetings, so you are aware that there's an ongoing discussion about affirmative action and equal opportunity policies. Have you um, participated in any of that? Yes, to the extent that I could. And I'm very intrigued uh, with what has been um, revealed, exposed, what has not been done for many years here in Brookline, and the possibilities of what can happen. Okay. Questions for Mr. Sanabria? Yeah, I, just, just out of curiosity, um, what, uh, what do you think uh, could be done, or what sort of, uh, without giving a complete list, what, uh, what suggestions would you have? That's a, that's a good question. I think one has to look at the intricacies of hiring and why people get hired and why people don't get hired and whether qualified candidates that are of color are called back several years after they're told that there are no positions available. Um, whether that, um, uh, I think that there's, there, there's one avenue that can be explored. I also think that it's important that the town of Brookline becomes more diverse, not just in the lower echelon, but in the upper echelon of, the, of its structure. I have heard and seen um, and have experienced complaints, even myself personally, I've been treated um, as a second-hand citizen. Uh, and I've complained. I also uh, have heard stories from other minorities. And I don't think that really reflects the atmosphere that this town portraits, not only here, but to the rest of this country. Okay, I guess I'm going to follow up um, then with a different question or maybe um, what role would the commission then play? I'm not absolutely sure. I think that that's something that needs to be explored. But one thing that is in play is the policies that really haven't been implemented. Okay, other members, questions? Second Daly? Yeah, no, I just wanted to ask, when you say you've been the victim of discrimination, uh, in uh, in what context? Well, it's interesting. I am um, I pay the bills for our condo association, uh, and I uh, went to the and annex the when the town hall was over at the um, Lincoln Nine. School, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, right. And um, and I don't want to basically give any names out, but um, I did go to pay a bill, and I was basically, um, the person in charge there was very, very rude, and didn't really care um, on how she was treating me. And I don't know if it's because <clears throat> I didn't have my Brooks Brothers suit on, or because of how I looked, but I complained to the person in charge the person in charge said, yes, I have received reports of this person, and there's not much I can do uh, because of union, I guess it was. Uh, there was some something there where they received complaints from this person, but they were, there wasn't much they could do. So, And this person, from what I understand, after talking to some of her subordinates, um, have also treated the subordinates cruel and minority subordinates. So um, I think that that's one of the things that upset me a few years ago. And I'm really glad that at least as busy as I am, I'm trying to make a difference here in this town because I think this town is better than what I experienced. Well, I guess I want to apologize for whatever may have occurred, and it sounds like other people might have experienced that same thing. And people that can't speak English, that are in the social, economic 
class that is at a disadvantage. So sure. they can't really defend themselves. So they can't get a lawyer. So I'm hoping that with some um, cooperation that we can make a difference as a whole sure. with this committee. I, I, I guess I'm, I, I don't want to misunderstand or mischaracterize you, but it seems to me that there were uh, customer relations issues with not just minorities from what you're describing. It might have been someone who was not being um, properly responsive and polite in general. Is that correct? Well, I can't answer that yeah. because I'm only talking about, talk the, about, about myself and, and, and other Hispanics that have shared that with me that actually work in the town. So Right. Okay. Well, thank you for bringing that to us, and I do apologize. Selectman Goldstein. Uh, no, I, I wanted to, I'm just going to join in the, uh, the apology on behalf of the town. Um, I, I hope that it was not a racially motivated event. Our, our, our staff is, uh, it, you know, as much as we want them to be perfect, they are human beings and occasionally uh, fail in their, in their customer service missions too. Um, I, I, I wanted to just say that when you came up here, you said, as you can see, I'm, I'm a minority. It's funny, I, I didn't have that. I couldn't see that you were a minority. I'm not sure when I saw you sitting out there, I, it, 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 it didn't occur to me that you were a minority. And, and uh, you know, I hope that, I don't know, why, don't, why, don't you, do, why don't you address that? I mean, I don't, I don't think that, I, I think that we've come to a point where we, we don't necessarily look at faces and trying to determine ethnicity that much is your is your experience no you're you're absolutely right that happens a lot and I, a lot of uh, people um, say gee you don't look Puerto Rican and I say I say, I say to them why because I don't have sneakers on because I'm not wearing a tilted hat I don't, I don't think uh, and looks no I'm not sharing I'm not saying that you're you're saying that but um, and I don't typically say this um, but uh, but I am here representing minorities and, and that's why I pointed that out. Um, and having experienced it, uh, whether naive or and as a young kid, or whether in the military, or um, I just uh, know that I hope in some ways I can offer some help to the town, to the Human Re uh, Relations Committee, and, um, and to society as a whole. <laughs> so. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your interest. We are very blessed in Brookline to have folks who are willing to volunteer a lot of time, and we welcome your interest in the Human Relations Commission. I will tell you my pat speech, which is we will let you know in writing. We're not making appointments now. We usually have a batch of interviews before we actually make any appointments. You will hear from us one way or the other when the appointments are made, however. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk here. and. Uh, I understand. Thank you. Thank you for your okay. interest. Thank you. Okay. Now we are moving to the advisory committee budget. The pizza eating crowd. <laughs> As, uh, Harry Bors uh, speaking on behalf of the advisory committee. Uh, yes, I should point out that we are a... a um, Citizen You're also a hard-working group of volunteers. <laughs> Citizen volunteer committee, not a corporate committee, but we have right. no intention of becoming a corpulent committee either. Um, <laughs> but, but you will notice uh, in our budget there, there are a couple of changes. Uh, one is a bit of an uptick in supplies, which is in fact for food. As you know, we're trying to get away from just greasy pizzas. and Healthy. Healthy. Well, bring Healthy. in sandwiches from a couple of the local shops. In fact, we've also tried the... Uh, the high school has a culinary group oh, over great. there. Oh, great. That's nice yeah, to know. Yeah, I mean, it, they can be a little bit more, but they, they do a great job, and we figure, you know, it's a nice way to sort of run it from one pocket to the other. So do to you speak. get food at every single meeting? No, no, we don't. Oh. We don't. Um, and I'll also <laughs> mention we're up to 28 in our membership now. So, so that's a change. Uh, the, the big news, I think, in our budget, actually, is in terms of personnel, um, and that's our administrative assistant, uh, bumping it up from a 0.35 position to a 0.4 uh, 
uh, what we found is we use that position quite a bit. Uh, I think once you start using email, it's even easier to use people. You try not to overuse them, but you do. Uh, whether it's committee members or whether it's other people submitting things to the committee or, or sending things in to be distributed. Um, and I have the sense now, sort of looking back, I suspect a number of our past employees probably were a bit conservative in estimating the time they used because we really do ask a lot of them. As you know, Wendy Prey was with us for the last few years. Um, she no longer is. Uh, She's young and recently married and was looking for full-time work and was able to find it, which is great for her. We've just hired a new person, Ann Brody, who happens to be a Brookline resident, which is oh, kind good. of nice. Uh, so she started with us. She's been working with Ben Vivante on uh, developing some new software templates. So we think this should work well. So that's, I think, the excitement ar around our budget, uh, as much as there can be. Um, I should, while I'm here, comment to our membership. Um, as you know, Neil Wyshynski, who was vice chair for some time, has stepped down. Uh, I can't tell you how long he served. And if I knew and said it, he would probably be embarrassed, but he's been with us for quite some time. I can time. tell you at least. It's, it's, it's been a while. Um, <laughs> as you know, he's, he stepped down to run uh, for the position of selectman, and I suspect unless there's a last minute sticker campaign, he will be coming your way. And perhaps from your standpoint, it's not so much him stepping down as much as stepping up, perhaps. Uh, I, I, will make, I will make this observation. Um, for us, it's a loss. For you, it will be a gain. I think for the community, it will be a wash. Because no matter where Neil serves, he is just a, a great participant. Um, and then finally, well, and then our other membership change, which this is more of a sad note. We lost Estelle Cates, as you know, right. only recently. Um, I should say. Her spirit, her commitment, her values are still alive and well, though. So and we plan to keep it that way. And then finally, as long as I'm at the podium, I would just like to make a comment about town staff, because we rarely get a chance to, and just what a pleasure it is really to work with them. Uh, they may not always feel that way. I know sometimes we give them a rash. It goes with the territory. But they really are. We've got just a great group of people, uh, very impressive. I suspect most calls that come into town hall wind up being complaints because that's human nature. But I think uh, people really recognize what a good crop of folks we have there. And certainly we on the committee do who work with them on a regular basis. So, Well, thank you for the kind words. Um, any questions for Mr. Boris? Yeah, actually, <laughs> I'm unless I'm misreading this, I don't see an increase in the food budget. Oh, you will. <laughs> no, I think this was, I think you have an earlier spreadsheet, ah. and I think what's being recommended is, is a bit okay. about that. Right? Well, I, I think on a per capita basis, uh, you are. Um, Wait, what does it come under? Well, it, it went from 1467 to 2275, which I was, gather is an increase. 2275. No, 2275. It's supplies. The supplies. past year's 2275, and it's. Budget. Carried at the same amount. It remains. It's, yeah, it's the same. No, as no this but year. we're this is my the recommendation. That's his. Oh, the I see. This is actually that. less than. Yes. Okay. Oh. Yes. The advisory committee is recommending an increase yes, in the supplies. We so. haven't changed our pants size yet. Don't, oh, don't you do and this I, every year? Haven't you been voting we, yourselves <laughs> increases? No, we've we've been debating it for years and recently. Put it I, up. Let, and let I all all joking aside, I think if. If we sort of looked at the per capita food budget uh, or uh, the, the per meeting budget for the advisory committee, it would be really a pittance. Uh, the, uh, I don't you know. Have some, 20 of us, some of us <laughs> served back in the day. Right. We were but, unfair. You know, we I, didn't bring your own crackers. I, 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 would, I would not want to compare it to the selectmen's food budget <laughs> on a per capita basis. I, I will say I'm prone to be one of those people when I go careening out the door at work to come over here. If I can grab uh, a candy bar in the car, I'm pretty happy. But that's not a lifestyle or, or a choice of food that I would condone or recommend. And well, I, I will uh, actually concur with Selectman Daly that we did not enjoy a supplies budget of this um, generosity. However, I do believe that the advisory committee members who come for meetings uh, in a very in a sort of tight time frame, very intense meetings, and do come from wherever they are from work uh, immediately to take up 
a lot of important information um, and are very valuable um, sort of sounding board for issues for all of us in town. And I do think healthy pizza is probably <laughs> justified. <laughs> No, but what, I, I think you should be eating salads myself, but that's okay. Can I ask what the actual figure is that you have voted yourself? Uh, it, you, they're recommending an increase of five hundred dollars. Okay. Okay. All right. So it's going to be twenty. And where would that five hundred come from? What What are you <laughs> suggesting? Well, we're, we're figuring that that uh, revenues for the uh, parking meters are probably going to increase now that they're more convenient. So. Okay. We shall see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I, just for the, uh, everybody, we don't, we're not voting budgets. We're just hearing uh, budget explanations tonight. So moving along, our next budget is the town clerks. Mr. Ward. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Town Administrator. Um, I feel guilty every time I, I try to uh, put something together here and study the budget because it's really not much. It never really fluctuates or changes much. What you have before you is the difference. Uh, we have a decrease of approximately $94,000, which represents about 15% of the total budget, and that's due to uh, um, uh, basically the administration of one election as opposed to three from the previous year. It's mitigated some by some uh, and, and gratefully appreciated by uh, recommendations by the town administrator to increase uh, the salaries of the poll workers. Uh, and also, uh, it's also mitigated by step increases and um, longevity. Uh, beyond that, uh, that's pretty much really what it comes down to. Uh, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the accomplishments, uh, elections, elections, elections. You know, I mean, all I can tell you is we started off uh, 2012 anyways, uh, we started off with the redistricting and the implementation of the new precinct lines. Uh, then we went right into a presidential preference primary, and then an annual town election, and then a state primary, and then a state election that included president and vice president on the ballot. Um, it was uh, pretty substantial work. It was a lot of work going. It's not, it's, it's the presidential cycle is always difficult. Uh, it's not uh, like that every year or every other year, uh, but it's every four years. But some of the things I'd like to point out to the board, uh, what transpired during, uh, because of the presidential election cycle, is that um, we recorded uh, approximately 6,800 new registered voters. Uh, we processed about 3,470 inactive registered voters, basically taking them from active status to inactive status. Uh, we amended 35,124 affidavits of voter registration in terms of either status party affiliation, address, or deletions. Um, and then we also processed uh, over 6,000 absentee ballot applications and certified more than uh, 7,800 signatures for petitions and nominations. So we had a pretty busy year. And, uh, and then add all the other things that we do into that. Uh, I, I'd say that we just, you know, maintaining what we do and doing it well, um, I think, is, is the major accomplishment. Now, in terms of the objectives, well, you know, it's uh, what we do uh, primarily is administrative um, in, uh, in nature, and, and then in, um, it's all in an effort to basically provide accurate and reliable information and to, to protect the rights of voters and citizens. Um, I'd like to say it, it sounds it, there's some sexy things there uh, that we can be creative in some of those, those things. And there really isn't much leeway to do that. I mean, some of the creativity that we do have, uh, we used this year. We had kids voting. Uh, we only had it in two schools because those are the only two schools that were interested in it. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, that was a real success. And I got to tell you, it's one of the, it's one of my favorite times because there's nothing more important than watching you know a primary school child you know voting for president and vice president. They just really enjoy it. So it was a real blast, uh, both at St. Mary's and at Park School. Uh, but there's relatively little room for creativity. I mean, we're, we're governed by a myriad of statutes, statutes and regulations. Uh, we don't have much avenue to basically expand and explore. Uh, but what we do do is uh, we do it well. And, uh, and I'll take any questions. Okay, Slightman Daly. Yeah, so, um, I, I, and thanks for all the hard work this year. I know it was a lot of uh, 
a lot of election activity. But um, I just want to say, and I realize this is only an issue uh, in like presidential elections because we uh, uh, sadly don't get a real great turnout for many of the other elections. But certainly uh, at my polling place, Precinct 12, there were long, long lines, and it was a very slow process. And I would like to suggest that you break the book into two and have so you know you have pe people can come up uh, and and talk to two people instead of just one person with one book, so that the line the line was um, uh, over over an hour, uh, well over an hour, and which is a long time for people to um, to stand there to vote. Well, uh, to respond to that respectfully, uh, that 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 suggestion has been made virtually after every presidential election. We're limited by what we can do with the street or with the voting lists. Uh, we can't break it down by name uh, because we're too large of a community uh, by last name, by surname. Mm -hmm. uh, you can break it down alphabetically by street, but there's problems with that. What if you live in a, in a, in a, group of, a grouping of streets that have like a Washington and Beacon Street and you're going to have like people go in one line going through a lot quicker than that line? I mean, there's, a, there's an issue of equity there. I mean, everybody suffers when you have to wait in line. And I must say, too, that, you know, I voted at 10 o'clock, you know, because my job allows me to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. I was, there wasn't a single person in line. I, I mean, was at the, Precinct 12 at 10 o'clock, and the line was huge. Well, huge. I, all, I can, all I can tell you is, is my experience, and the crush is usually be, uh, before work and after work. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I... This is, at, at Precinct 12, this time, it lasted the entire morning. It didn't start slowing down at all until afternoon. Well, I and look at that were, as a good thing. No, it was a good thing. I I'm mean, just, the only problem is, is that, and, and, and some of the comments that I did receive, particularly with Precinct 12 and 13, uh, was that a lot of the voting year, voting booths were empty while the people were still right, waiting Right, exactly. Line. It wasn't like it was continuously filled all the way through. Right. But again, the only way to do that so is... So the, the bottleneck was your people checking them in at the table. My, and our people. Our people. Our, our people. people. And, and that's I'm, one of the reasons why I, I, rec I, I asked and, and I received the request for increases to uh, attract better people. Uh, no, but, but I don't. I don't think it was their fault. It, it was, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a tough job. It's a system. But I'm it's saying, a, it's if, a, it's if a manual you had, page flipping system, right? But if you split that book in half, so one person. Well, I, I respectfully disagree with you. I think that's going to be a problem because if I'm waiting in line on one set of books because it has a lot more people in that books because it's broken down because I happen to live on Washington Street or Beacon Street. All right. Wait. Wait. I, I, we're not going to resolve this, but I do have a different question for you, which sure. is not splitting the book, it's having two books. It would require some time to reconcile two books, but if there were two books, you would then have the opportunity to have your queue move more quickly because pe people would have equal access to two books as opposed to everybody having to go through one. And I do know places where that is done, so don't tell me it cannot be done. Well, I, you know, I, I'm not argumentative here. I respect your suggestions. You know, I'm just saying that's a recipe for disaster. That's a, that's a real problem. I mean, you know, you're really talk, you're talk, I mean, where is it done? Is it done in communities less than 6,000 people? Because I'm betting that's probably true. You know, we have 50, we have over 40,000 registered voters and 56,000 residents. Big difference. All right, how many actually voted? 79%. Based upon the active and inactive status, if you took the inactives out of there, because approximately for three quarters of them don't even live in town uh, anymore, but I have to keep them on the voting list because of federal law. Uh, it was probably like an 85 to 90 percent turnout. Okay. Yes, Slightman Binko. Yeah, Pat, um, I, I actually didn't plan on getting into the mechanics, but given the colloquy that's mm -hmm. going on here, um, I was a, a legal observer um, in Hopkinton uh, for um, the um, well, for one of the campaigns, uh, actually two of them for for the. Kennedy Warren campaigns, and they have four precincts in the town of Hopkinton, and each precinct um, they had um, three poll workers checking people in with the lists for the precinct broken down by street. Um, I, I completely agree that you can't have two books, uh, two duplicate yeah. books, but they had a third of the voters in each of in each of those um, uh, in each of those books 
uh, with you know a third of the voters for streets, um, you know Apple Drive to uh, Fernwood, and then G to whatever, and and um, and it worked very smoothly because the people standing in line um, could see that uh, you know the, the A to F streets were here, the G to L streets were here, and the M to Z streets were here. They knew which of those to get into, and there was uh, perhaps, um, you know, at, at times there might be two or three people more in one line than in the other, but there were more lines for people to go through. And it, I will say, it, it worked very, very smoothly. Um, yeah, I mean, on, on Beacon Street, though, if you say, if you put a sign out in front, say, if you're, if you're this number on Beacon Street, you go here. If you're this number on Beacon Street, you go to this person. I mean, I, I, I don't think people are s stupid, you know. I think they could figure no, I, that I, out. Yeah, and there were, well, I will me, say, there me, were a few. Say, let me just say this. I mean, these are historic complaints, mm -hmm. and, and I understand them completely, and I'd be more than happy to talk in length with you about them even further. I suspect that uh, the Hopkinton, if they only have four precincts, it's a much smaller community than Brooklyn. That's the first thing. Right. They have a and, they have a, and they have a central voting area, too. All four precincts are in one location. All right? four right. precincts are in right. one location. And that's common with a lot of communities that are smaller. Now, could we split the three? The answer is probably yes, and that would probably mitigate some of the concerns that I have about a Washington Street or a Beacon Street or something of that nature. But the problem is, is that, one, we don't have enough qualified people, and two, the, some of our polling locations are so small that they just don't, wouldn't allow for it. I mean, take a look at some of the polling locations that we have. We have 16, we have 15 locations for 16 precincts, and they're relatively small. Some of them are huge beyond comparison, uh, and then others are so tiny it's ridiculous. So I mean, there are some issues here, and I'm, I'm more than willing to explore it, but it requires more people, more talented people, and better space in order, if you want to achieve what you're trying to do, which is basically split it into three, three books, uh, and then have three sets of voters basically come to the polling location, and come to the table, and then move forward. I'm, I'm not quite sure that will resolve I, I was, the I was just going for two, but I, I w I'd be happy to talk with you more at some to. other time, let, let, let's, Yes, let's we'll just say it would be nice to find a way. It's going to be several years till we have another presidential election. Right. <laughs> so I mean, the, pan the panacea that many, many, uh, many in, the, uh, in the field that are looking at are basically having real-time voter registration uh, uh, electronically. Yeah. You're not going to see that in my lifetime. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I'm sad to say. But that's really some of the answers to some of the long line problems that you will have, uh, is that uh, you can look them up very quickly electronically and just move people along. Uh, what you have basically are older people trying to flip through a book and then trying to find somebody located by the street address and then find them by name. It's not, it's not an easy process. Uh, we've tried to look at it a few different ways. I don't think it'll work, but I'm, I'm open to suggestions. I, I don't I want to uh, have a budget question. Oh, good. good. Let's have a budget question. Well, actually, why don't you do your budget question first? Because <laughs> I have uh, I have a different subject. Yeah, I'm I'm actually I was curious about the uh, uh, discontinuing the CBE contract and data processing equipment repair and maintenance, and I'm wondering what what the, what is going on there. Um, yeah. It's, it's more a, a global thing than, than a micro. So we used to have a break fi fix contract for all the lease computers, um, and we kind of realized that it would be more effective for the IT department to take on that responsibility. So in all, a lot of the departments, you're going to see that that line item is okay. eliminated in 14. Okay. Uh, I don't. I don't want to debate the no, uh, no debate. The, the no, line. I appreciate the question. suggestions, I, but I do. I do want to say, in presidential elections every four years. I think an hour wait is not really that bad, considering what I hear goes on in in, in other parts of the country and other parts of the world. And uh, I think to to change the the whole system for the sake of an event that happens one day every four years, I mean, we, it, it would have to be. A, a pretty obvious uh, kind of a change in something. Yeah, that's and, and just, to just to sum it up, I mean, it's not to say that some of the suggestions made here this evening and, and elsewhere uh, wouldn't perhaps make a better, make it more improved, uh, but you have to look at it in the context of the administration of it. Some of the polling locations are so small. Some of our workers are so old. 
I mean, it's 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 really difficult to do that. And uh, but I'm more than willing to be open and honest uh, and, and and work towards doing something if that's the problem. But again, it, it only happens every four years. Um, and frankly, you know, I, I, you know, to relieve that situation, I'd advocate early voting. You know, I'm in Massachusetts. Right. I mean, that, that's a it's much easier. People prefer that uh, much uh, better. Although there are some people that would rather just go in in person and, 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 and vote. And vote. But most people, we, I'll just give you an example. We extended, because we were working pretty much every day up until the presidential uh, election, uh, we extended absentee voting. Uh, we had extended hours for absentee voting, and people loved it. I mean, I think we were open probably an additional eight or nine days beyond regular business hours <clears throat> uh, to uh, vote absentee. And so, um, you know, that's the reason why we had about 7,000 absentee ballot applications. And, I, and, and let me just say, you really, I think the town clerk's office really does deserve credit for that. I believe you were even open on the Sunday yes. before uh, the election uh, for people who couldn't get in during the week. Uh, and I, I think also on Saturday, but I know that you were open on Sunday because uh, um, that, uh, it, it struck me that, that that was an incredible accommodation. Well, you yeah, know, no, that was great. It doesn't I, take I too sent big people of a, in. It doesn't take too big of a light bulb to figure. If you're going to be there and you're going to be working, you might as well be open to, to, to assist people, and that's what we did. And we've done that now two presidential elections in a row, but we extended it even further this year because it was pretty significant, the, the interest. Quickly, while, while we've got you here, Patrick, I mm -hmm. wanted to ask about the upcoming combined election in May uh, that we, <laughs> we, we've already talked about, but you, now that you've worked it for a couple more weeks, how are the arrangements coming along for that, that dual ballot uh, election? I know it's something new for you. So. Well, you know, it'd be interesting because it actually, you know, because we'll be using two different voting lists, so it'll be interesting to see that impact, but we won't have the volume of a presidential election. Uh, and so that would be interesting. But no, we're moving forward. I mean, we're setting it up administratively fine enough. Uh, we believe, um, really, the only, the only concern that I have right now is, um, is there will be additional postage because we're required to send out, if anybody uh, requests an absentee um, ballot for the state primary, we're required to send them out as, uh, one for the town election as well. Uh, so they'll be getting two ballots. And that's a little bit of a concern because it's got to come back in the same, in different envelopes and, uh, and so, you know, but we'll, we'll get through that and we'll figure that one out. But uh, for the most part, it's, they have to have two separate voting lists because not everybody qualified uh, to vote in this town election is qualified to vote in the state primary. Uh, so that, there has to be two lists. So they'll be given two ballots uh, along with an instruction card basically telling them what to do. Uh, and essentially all they do is when they check out, they'll check out in both the, uh, state primary list and the annual town election list. And then they'll put both those ballots into the machine. Well, that actually gets me back to the queuing. Are there going to be, will there be one queue and you vote in the primary or you get checked off for the primary list and then you get checked off for the municipal list? No, or a it'll be, it'll be, one, it'll be, it'll be one, it'll be one queue and it's your option whether you want to pull both ballots or not. So you don't necessarily have, you don't to, be have to do it. But I you don't understand, have to do it. But you're supposing off. you wanted to do both. You would arrive at the table, and yeah. the, the first one we would probably do. I don't, you know, we'll probably flip a coin uh, and say, well, the first one you do is the annual town election. The second one you do is the uh, state primary. They'll both be at the same table. So you get your one ballot there. You get your other ballot there, and then you'll be given a card with instructions on what to do, which are relatively simple. You mark both ballots. You go and check out at the checkout table, doing the same thing. Go to the town election table first if you right. pull the town ballot, and you go to the um, uh, state primary uh, list if you pull the pull, also pull the state primary ballot. And then ultimately, when you've checked out, you just put both ballots into the machine. You're all set, and you just drop the instruction card off the table. Now the problem I see, you know, queuing, is what if somebody doesn't want to do his town ballot? All they want to do is vote in the state primary. You know, they've got to figure it out. So we're going to have some extra people there uh, guiding people through it and make sure everything's done all right. But it's a relatively simple process. It's not hard at all. Uh, the hard part, as I said earlier, is the administrative part of it, handling with the absentee ballots. But again, um, we're, you know, at this time prior to the presidential election, I probably had over, I don't know, 4,000 applications, most, uh, probably more than, say, 500 from overseas. I've only had one uh, one application so far from overseas. Oh, really? So oh. I've had, the volume just isn't going to be sure. there in terms of absentees. So I'm not that concerned about it. But the, can the can the ballots both go in the same machine? Yes. 
And and the machine's going to know that some of them yes. are for one thing and some of them are for because the coding. Yeah. It's, it's Hallelujah fun. barcodes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. It's the timing marks on, on it's, the balance. It's like when you when you check your stuff out in a through a, a register place, your peanuts are not coded in as you know firecrackers or something. Okay. <laughs> Slightly bigger. Is there thanks? Is there any update on electronic voting at uh, town meeting? Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, explored some of the problems we had in reporting. Uh, I think some of them are our fault. Uh, others were part of the, the stiffness of the program, uh, and um, we've made uh, we've made advances to the company. Uh, there's some changes being recommended for reporting purposes that will probably be done gratis. They're suggesting other changes that might cost more money. Uh, we've yet to meet, but we'll be meeting shortly with the moderator and IT department to kind of go over those recommendations. Uh, but uh, clearly, uh, um, you know, it's an electronic system. I mean, I talked to the, the, the one or two communities that handle it. The only one that was a represent uh, was well, actually Wayland, but Wayland is in a representative town meeting, and um, they had a, a, a failure at town meeting with it. It just completely just died on them. and. Uh, uh, and so they went back to the old process, and that's what, that will be available to us. So it is electronic. It does have problems uh, because it is electronic. But generally speaking, it was a, it was a big success. People love it. And I, I tend to see that we'll probably see a lot more votes on, on every article with it. Uh, the difficult part the first time out in November was the reporting part. People were very frustrated that we couldn't get it up into the website. And part of that problem was, uh, frankly, is that I'll, you know, I'll put, I'll blame occurs with us because it was user error, because we, couldn't, we didn't figure it out in time. Uh, but part of that reason why we didn't figure it out in time was because the training session that was provided to the IT people from the vendor was done on a version that they didn't give us, that they hadn't ready yet. It was, it was a pilot version. So many of the things that we thought we could do with it didn't get done. And so it was difficult to report. So we had to basically manually go around, cut and paste, and get it done. And we probably didn't get it up on the website until I think it was four days later, and that certainly was unacceptable to a lot of people. Now, the next couple of sessions, they were up there right away. Uh, but it was the first night of town meeting. Uh, actually, the second night, was it was up there right away. The, uh, the first night was very difficult because we had a lot of problems with the database. But it worked, you know, and, and I think it'll work even better uh, next time around, once we're, now that we're more familiar with it. So are these changes going to be implemented for this May town uh, meeting? Some of them. Some okay. of them. I, I just, it's just a matter, it's a matter of money. It's a matter of what the vendor is willing to do as, as, as a matter of uh, built-in service. So is that something that would be carried in your budget, the, whatever this uh, I believe it's carried be? in IT budget, but we're not talking uh, significant monies. But, okay. um, uh, and again, it's, it's funny. It's, um, there aren't many vendors out there that do this, believe it or not. Uh, and not many had focused on town meeting. And uh, so the reporting that this vendor does was, a gen was generally uh, was devised by sitting down with the town, uh, uh, a member of the Town Meeting Members Association in Framingham uh, and seeing what they would like. Uh, so it's, it's, it's sort of like a hodgepodge they're reporting. Uh, it's gotten better. I don't like some of the things that they have. Uh, frankly, I think I want to memorialize as much information as we possibly can. Um, their spreadsheets don't allow that. So, I mean, we've got some work to do. We'll certainly have something for, for the annual town meeting, but I think there are uh, more improvements that will be made long term. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, as you heard, I'm sure this was to discuss but not to vote budgets, um, which we will be doing at a later time. Thank you for and your... Like I said, I'd be more than happy to speak to any individual selectman on the matter of, uh, of splitting the voting lists and see uh, what works. Okay. okay. Very good. Take thank care. you, Mr. Ward. Thank you. Chief O'Leary. <clears throat> Can I ask one question? I think this is maybe for Melissa, but there's, there's uh, benefits in the budget, um, but there, there's also a benefits section that's separate. So which benefits are being put in the department budgets and which are still in the benefits section? So the benefits section is what you should be looking at. That's just the, what you see in each departmental um, budget section is our estimate of the allocation of those benefits. Okay. Right. It's, it's a f meant to provide us with a fully um, 
I don't, how should I say this, fully loaded budget. Yep. Okay. <laughs> right, right. But I'm just saying Even though that Mr. Mr. Ward's budget would have gone down more had those benefits not been put in. So it's, it's not exactly an apples to apples comparison to prior years, right? The, um, the benefits, um, I think, is separate from the overall budget uh, allocation well, listed actually, in the added It's added in. R right. But the, so he, the, he, it looks like his budget went down, went up from last year, when in fact it it didn't. If you weren't counting those benefits, that's just what I was confused no, the, about. The bottom line change in his budget is a decrease of ninety four thousand. It's, yeah. it's yeah. on page four dash twenty nine. The total, the total line, okay. which is above the benefits so line. I'm, I'm supposed to disregard the the, bo the bottom bottom line. Right. Which is yeah. It's more for informational kind of. Okay. Right. All right. Sorry. Okay. Thanks, Thank Melissa. Good evening. Good evening. So yours is a very simple budget with no pizza. No, unfortunately, no. And I haven't had dinner yet either, so I'm kind of hungry. But uh oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I just like to kind of recap a little bit about the the year that we're in now and and. The year that ended um, also at the end of December, just to say a little bit about um, how we spend our money. And, and I think I provided the board, I know I provided the board about a month ago with a report on what we did for 2012. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I do want to say that um, we put a lot of effort into our reducing our crime rate and apprehending those that come over here are, are in town and they uh, commit crimes. And our crime rate did go up a little bit. It went up about 1.8 percent, but if you look at that uh, crime rate on a whole, it's actually our second lowest year in since at least uh, I've been here 35 years, at least that long. I know that we provided you with a chart going back to 1994, and you've seen a steady decline. Um, we're not happy that we still get about 960 or 970 Part A crimes, but um, we are seeing a downward trend, and it's continuing today. Um, our burglaries for 2012 were down, our assaults were down, our motor vehicle thefts were down. Um, our robberies did go up by a little bit, um, but our larcenies were, really drove that crime rate up um, a little bit um, by 1.8 percent. But right now, as of this week, going into 2013, we're down 33 percent. Um, I think it, it's a big number to be down and trying to attribute why it's down, um, there's a variety of factors. We have more officers on the street. Uh, as you know, we hired nine this past year. Um, we are doing a lot different ways as to how we're assigning our people. Um, our officers are very active. They're doing a really good job following up on things and seeing crime uh, patterns develop and, and finding ways to disrupt them. And, and I think part of it went for some pretty, um, we had those robberies that occurred and a robbery and a stabbing that occurred in North Brookline. Fortunately, our officers did really fine work. Uh, arrests were made right away and we got um, some pretty good press that, and we may even have, we with that good press be able to keep some of the crime down and, and people seeing that if they come, come here or they're in here and they want to decide to commit crimes, they, there's a good possibility that they're going to get caught. So there's a lot of factors as to why the crime went, is down this year. Um, 33 percent so far, and uh, our goal is to drive it down even further as we go through it. Um, I also provided you with a race and gender report, and those numbers that we uh, have been keeping since 1997 and distributing since 1997 um, were all just about the same over the years. It really haven't seen any big fluctuations up or down. A couple of weeks ago, I went to the Human Relations Commission and provided them with the, uh, the report as well, and we talked a little bit about the race and gender report that we had. Um, distributed. And, and just a, a couple of the things that uh, we're in the process of doing now in, our, in the department is going to continue through the spring and into the summer. Um, so it does go into next year, next year's budget. But um, we've done a lot of work on some of the, um, the civilian workload in, in the department. And I think one of the things I'd like to talk about in particular is our detail collections. Uh, you know that we get audited on our details. Um, there's a lot of money that the town brings in, and we had to find a way to uh, increase our collection rate. And 
our business manager who's sitting here, Anthony, uh, deserves an awful lot of credit because he put in systems in place to um, go after the collections. We sped up the collections where right now, within 105 days, we collect 99% of the uh, monies that are owed to us. Those people that are in arrears beyond the 105 days are brought to court. Um, we speed up the process in court to try to get collections before they go out of business. Um, and we've, we've seen a real increase in uh, our collection rate. Part of our time going forward on the budget is you know that we're doing more performance based and we threw a little challenge out there that um, we want collections of 96%, 95% after 90 days. Um, I think right now, if you looked at our numbers, they're about 93%. So you know we can get, we know we can get there, Anthony, right? <laughs> and uh, the things, things like that, we're trying to improve in, in the back office. We, as you know, I talked a little bit about when I asked for permission to go ahead and fill the supervisor's position in traffic, that we're rearranging that entire office. Uh, in the process of hiring for that position, uh, we're combining the civilian staff in the business office, the records in the traffic department. We're bringing a lot of increases in technology in there. Uh, we're trying to get the public who um, receive parking tickets to do a lot more online with us to eliminate some of the uh, traffic flow that comes into the window and the appeals that we want to get them to use uh, online appeals more. Uh, we do have um, a phone tree that we put in place directing people to how to use the online appeals. We've also put it up on our Facebook. Um, we want them to um, save a trip to the station, give it to us online, we'll respond to you online. And I think it'd be a much more efficient way to do that. Um, along with that ticketing process, later this month, we hope to get in our new ticketing machines. Um, we will then train our, our, all of our civilian staff who ticket to use the uh, new, new um, machines that will issue the tickets, we'll be able to do data entry a lot easier. Uh, data entry will come from the street. These ticket meters, I know I've told you before, you can go right up to the inspection sticker, put it on the inspection sticker, all the information downloads for you. Um, I think it's going to speed up the processing out on the street. It's going to eliminate a lot of the um, data entry that we do in the station. Uh, we look now that the civilian staff writes a little over 90,000 parking tickets a year. Our goal uh, would be all of those go get written by these machines. Right now, out of those 90, there's about 70, 70, 69, 70,000 that get written by the pens. Uh, we look to increase that and get all of the, the tickets that are written by civilian staff. Eventually, then we're gonna start rolling it out to the offices, uh, and it, if we can get the offices to do at least the all-night parking on those machines, that'll eliminate a lot more. Um, we've also done, I hope you'll be able to notice an increase in some of our social media outreach. Um, we're trying to do a lot more over with Twitter, we've upgraded our Facebook. We have a meeting with a consultant coming in Friday to tell us a little bit more about how to utilize and keep up to date on our Facebook and our Twitter uh, accounts. We just started expanding Twitter to our patrol supervisors. We felt that they, um, the sergeants that are on the street, run the street. Um, they are, have been provided with smartphones that they can take the picture, uh, tweet something out, uh, warn the public if there's an accident, if something takes place. And for instance, earlier this week, there was a single car accident up on Route 9. Car hit a tree um, up around the Starbucks on Route 9 inbound. Sergeant responded to the call, took a picture, put out, you know, traffic uh, is backed up on Route 9, find an alternate route, show a picture of the accident and how it was blocking the parking lane and one lane of travel. So those are the things we want to uh, keep moving forward on as far as that goes. Um, one of the things that I know that a lot of people heard from is how we handle the loud parties and the nuisance complaints. I'm happy to report that we've seen a decline of about 28% in our loud party calls this past week and we didn't get any in town, which was really unusual. Um, our parties are down. Our um, nuisance calls for noise is down a little bit. It's down about 1%, which isn't a lot. Uh, in all told, because of that, our citations are down compared to what we did last year as far as the uh, town bylaw violation. But I think the key was to get those loud parties down. People have asked me what we did differently this year. Uh, Lieutenant Harrington uh, had 
explored with other departments on how they handle loud parties. And he put a team in place back in, uh, over Labor Day weekend, which was the move-in day for um, a lot of our students and their parents, which was particularly uh, good for us because we were able to meet the parents, provide them with the bylaw, provide them with the blue view that we had printed up. I explained to them what would happen if we get called to their son or daughter's apartment, uh, the fines that they could incur, and we continue to work with the schools. And, and that was the big thing that we did differently in a 28% 20, a 20, um, decline, 26% decline in loud parties thus far this year is, is pretty good. Um, we're not happy that it's still as much as we get. We will continue to try to knock it down. We're going to try to look for a different way. Uh, if there's anything more we can do when we have the parents undivided attention in the beginning of September. <laughs> so um, going into next year, our budget is increased by about 9.9%. Most of that, about 100000 is based on uh, salary, salary costs. Uh, the others are some software and some equipment and some training things that we, that we want to do. Um, I hope to see an increase in uh, some of the grant funding that we have. Uh, you know, I've come here this past uh, couple of sessions ago and, and had some money approved for, for grants, and I think one of those grants I talked about with that traffic enforcement grant, the, the uh, traffic uh, accident reporting grant would be really beneficial to us if we can get it off the ground. Um, and I plan to come back on some UAC grants in another couple of weeks that will help us in the area of our special response team that we're trying to – that we uh, – are in the process of putting together. And uh, you'll be hearing more about that in a, another couple of weeks. Great. So um, I can just point out a couple of things that we're looking at for per performance-based uh, over on the um, on our, our um, performance and workload indicators. We took a look at a, a kind of a different way about approaching some of the, some of the way we uh, – we budget this year, and we're trying to identify areas that we can uh, grade our offices on. I know Mr. Kleckner had got us to start doing some SMART goals that we did department-wide throughout the year in order to accomplish some things. Um, this year, going, we're going to judge ourselves on the crime, crime clearance rate. Uh, in 2012, it was 41% uh, uh, of our Part 8 crimes were cleared. We want to increase that. Uh, we were actually meeting on it last week to make sure that we we're all up to speed on how we're going about doing it. Uh, we also are going to look more at uh, DNA collection. We're seeing a decline in identifying criminals through their fingerprints that they leave on the scene. Uh, we've seen that a lot of people that are coming out and committing our burglaries are repeat offenders. They're not kids. And they've learned when they got sent away for us identifying them through fingerprints a little while ago. So um, we also are going to look at, uh, we found a, we started doing a, do way, a new way to, inter, to uh, investigate graffiti complaints, where we concentrated on graffiti that was a pattern, or that was being done by a group of people, or one person that was responsible for a lot of them. And some of the smaller graffiti, we've been asking the DPW to clear up right away. And we don't even investigate it. It was just kind of a smarter way to, to work out personnel. And I, I know that, that you were made aware of back just in the beginning of the summer, we made it, uh, three arrests. Those three people were responsible for 280-something incidents of graffiti in town. Uh, we did search warrants out in one of the homes in Clinton, one in Brighton. Um, it was a really good case that they developed, uh, and I somebody was traveling all the way from Clinton to do graffiti in Brookline. Yes, their friends went. One of the friends went to an, a school in Brookline, and the other one lived, I think, just oh, just in Brighton. And um, the three of them got together, and yes, <laughs> and we were in their house in the basement of the house. The whole basement was graffitied. I think the parents were letting him ex express himself in the basement, but he was branching out. Okay. So I think I think I could stop there and open it up for questions. Slightman <laughs> Banker. Just on before we leave that subject, what is the status of those cases now? I think they're still winding their way through court. Um, I know that I don't think that they've been settled. I'm pretty sure that they're still going to court. Good. I should check on that. I, I... Slightman Daly. Yeah. No. I I had noticed the. Uh, 
the detailed collection thing because this has been a perennial sore mm -hmm. point for the audit committee. So I want to compliment you and Mr. Anseldi on that. And um, I also see that you're, you're doing quite well on the parking ticket collections as well. So. Yes. Very good. We've, um, been, we've been speeding the, um, the second notice notices up. Um, the, the, we would, in years past, we were kind of bound by the registry where their computer system was antiquated compared to ours, and we had to pay a certain fee no matter how many tickets we sent to them, so it was, wasn't really cost effective to send it quickly. Um, now we do it ourselves, and, the, and when it gets to be marked by the registry, they've been upgraded their system so we don't have the built-in time delay anymore, and we can move quicker on it. That's what we're doing. Um, I, I did have a question, though. I was concerned to see that the domestic violence investigations, the actuals for 2012, were up from prior years. Is, is that, and I, I notice your estimate for 2014 is even a little higher, um, is that um, because you, your department is making that more of a focus, or are there simply more domestic violence issues? Well, we've always really concentrated on it. So it's really not us making it more of a focus. We do a lot a lot of outreach. We do encourage people to report it. I mean, I don't think we've ever not done that. Um, maybe maybe it, that accounts for some of it, but we do follow through. Uh, Doreen Gallagher, who you all know, has been fabulous on following through on cases. And uh, it, it is unfortunate that we have as many as we have. Um, but we are on top of it. Uh, we do try to get people to go ahead with the restraining orders. We'll help them get the restraining orders. We'll help them if they have to get into their houses and uh, collect their belongings and go somewhere else. It's a it's a difficult crime, and I think I think what you, what we've seen more recently, which is a a good trend, is that we've seen third parties call us in the, in in the house hearing something going on next door in the apartment building that they do call, uh -huh. and that way um, we can investigate it. So it, it might be an awareness of everybody on domestic violence, and that a third-party caller is extremely important because a lot of times, as you know, a victim is not going to report it. Uh -huh. right. yes. Selectman Goldstein. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chief, for that uh, coherent presentation. Uh, just two things I want to ask about. In the patrol services sub budget, you have an increase of $65,000 for capital. Is there some new equipment uh, plan there, or what's, what's the driving force be behind that uh, increase? That may be the handhelds. <laughs> Probably just the way the vehicles are allocated. I'm sure last year he probably bought some in traffic, and now they're in patrol. Yeah. It's the same amount of vehicles as last year. And so I'll so, agree with Melissa. So those are, <laughs> those are for vehicles then. Okay. And uh, in the traffic division, there's a uh, increase in services. Is, is there something that's being changed in that? It, it'll be. The, I, I'm assuming it's the handhelds. The handhelds that we're going to be getting. In March of this year, uh, they're all they're all um, wire, they'll be the wireless system that we have. So, so it'll be funding and supporting those. So the, the, the ticket. This, uh, it's so, but that's it's not a capital item. It's it's under services. So is that is that for the? It, it would be probably probably be the software to go with it. Yeah, that's the services. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's the service that goes with the handhelds. No, I don't think we actually buy them anymore, isn't a, instead of buying them, you acquire them and pay the, the service fees as opposed the to the upfront cost of the equipment itself. Okay, so is the, is is that the approximate $38,000? That's what we expect to get to, that's what we expect the services for those handheld devices to be in the, in the $40,000 range? Uh, I think it's more than 60000 services increased by 14,000 but the contract that Anthony's referring to is where is a $60,000 contract but there's also a reduction in printing services and um, repair maintenance as well and wireless communications because the pens had um, had 
phone phone services that were associated with it, so that goes away, and the um, swapped in for the the professional tech, uh, contract for the um, the handheld ticketing. All right. Okay. That's it for now. All right, Simon Banker. Yeah, one one thing that I that I don't understand is on page uh, Roman numeral four dash forty two of the budget book. <clears throat> excuse me. It refers under the budget statement right at the very beginning. It refers to quote an increase in Quinn payments due to anticipated require retirements during the course of the fiscal year of twenty one thousand dollars. How does that happen? That as there are more retirements, Quinn payments increase. Because those, those the Quinn gets paid in July of every year, and then if you get retirements in the through the calendar year, or the through the fiscal year after that, you have to pay them a, a, a prorated amount. So they, if they retire in this in this the end of December, we owe them six months of Quinn payments. And so this year coming up. So it accelerates it earlier. Yeah, we, were, gotcha. we, esti okay. we estimated the it amount of people that could retire. It accelerates it from, from the next fiscal year into this fiscal year. Yes, because in July. Okay. It, yeah. Yeah, we actually have 14 or so, uh, 11 or 14 uh, police officers that could retire in early July. Yeah. So we just kind of put them behind the office uh, a little caution there that if they did, it's quite a Okay. And then, but then going forward in the next fiscal year, because the Quinn uh, cohort is fixed, that amount will be, will go down. It's yes. just, it's just, it's been moved from next fiscal year into this. Okay. Thank you. Can I come, yep. come back to that service contract for the handhelds for a <laughs> second? I'm sorry to beat a horse on it. Um, so. It's going to cost us sixty thousand dollars more more a year. Is that is is that fair to say? Yeah, or, or is there an offset? What, what, what yeah, there I, is there offset? I, the, the printing of the loss of tickets that we won't have to do. Yeah. Um, there's a replacement of pens. There was also supplies that we had uh, that we constantly were buying through the loss of. So um, yeah, it, it's a, a net little increase, but the decrease in, in um, the workloads is just going to be tremendous. So do, do we expect an offset? I, I know it's not a budget buster, but do we expect a, an increase in, in, in fines collected or a decrease in personnel? Or? No, I think we're going to see an increase because you're not going to, um, the, the, peop the, the computers and the data entry people are not going to have to deal with handwriting anymore. It, there's a lot of tickets that we can't enter in because there's scribble marks mm -hmm. and they can't read them. Those are going to go away. This is all going to be um, be inputted on a, on a computer, like a computer. It'll be a, a regular screen. It's not going to be any handwriting. Um, then we're going to see with the use of the um, the inspection sticker in some of the pre-loaded fields, you'll see the tickets being able to be written quicker. So we think it will get more tickets written by the people out on the street. Yes, I, 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 with these Please. Emails, too, the, um, Things like the permits for overnight parking is all going to be loaded in there. So if by chance, whereas Would, now, would you mind coming over to the microphone because some people can't hear you. Sure. So with these handheld devices, the permitting is actually loaded in who has the permit. So um, when they go up, an officer goes up or, or one of our civilian staff tries to give a ticket that may have a permit, it's going to say, this is okay. Whereas before, chances are they would have got the ticket and then they would have to appeal it. All right, so that's an interesting point. I thought the way of identifying the vehicle was to use the inspection sticker. How do you know they have a permit? It is. We're going to give them the information that we get, and the company's going to oh. load it into the uh, handhelds. I see. So you'll know the vehicle owner's identity or whatever it is, and then that gets um, coordinated with the sticker. Yeah, that's Excellent. correct. Excellent. Okay. But are they still going to get a, a thing on the car? Or yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Because my daughter drives a car registered to myself and my husband, but I like her to pay <laughs> yeah. her own tickets. So <laughs> it's going to come to you, I think. Right. <laughs> As no, the registered I'm not owner. paying her ticket. She's got to pay her own tickets. <laughs> All right. Any Thank other? You. I'm 
all said that. Okay. So I, I guess the, the message here is keep your inspection sticker up to date also because right. <laughs> officers on the street are going to be looking at every one as, right. as they're going around. Yep. Uh, I, I just have a, uh, an observation. I noticed in, I believe it's the Globe sometime in the last several days, um, mention of the number of concealed firearm licenses issued across the Commonwealth and was very interested to learn that Brookline had the second lowest number after some very small rural place in sort of western Massachusetts. I don't even remember the name anymore. Um, and I was very uh, interested and quite pleased to find that to be the case. Uh, I don't know whether that means we have fewer applicants or we turn them away or we have more rigorous requirements, but uh, it was a very interesting piece of information. I, I, I saw the same article. I, we do have a very rigorous um, application process and we do not give out a lot of um, concealed licenses to carry. Uh, when, when people come in, a lot of people do ask for that. But then as you talk to them, you try to find out really what, it, what they're looking at it for. A lot of it is for target. A lot of it might be for sporting, to going up hunting. Um, and we will limit their, um, their licenses to that. They have to come in with a real good reason to get a license to carry. Along those lines, um, we have seen an increase in applicants. Right now, um, we're at the same point as we were last year with licenses that we've either given out or renewed. However, there's about 29 people or 26 people waiting uh, an answer from us. So uh, we have seen an increase in the applicants. And w what they're going to be applying for and qualifying for, I'm not sure right now, but most of it will not be for a full uh, Class A license to carry. But I don't think that that this is, is um, as far as us being being low on the amount of license that we're given out, I think historically we've always been like that. Um, we just need a real good reason as to why you want a, want a gun license. All right. All right. So what I understand, therefore, is that anyone who wishes to have a license to carry has to be able to fully justify and explain why and that they are properly qualified to do it. Right. And they, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, they have, we send them to the range. They have to qualify with the firearm at the range. They got to have a safety, a safety um, course that they got to take. Right. And then uh, we do a background on them. Uh, we send their fingerprints to the state. And uh, that's probably why there's so many people left in the queue because I think a lot of people uh, are applying statewide and there's a uh, delay getting the fingerprints done. I, uh, I mean, the 26 is a lot, or 29 is sure. a lot for us, but we're waiting yeah. for the fingerprint checks to come back. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the chief? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, appreciate the uh, work that you and the officers are doing. And I was pleased to be able to say I haven't heard anything about coyotes for many months. <laughs> uh, it is it is March though. Remember I, last know, year, March I know, I know, I know. Spring is coming. I know, I know. <laughs> Maybe it's turkeys this year. Turkeys. Yeah, right. It's yeah, been attacked turkeys. turkeys. I understand. Well, even the even the turkey talk has died down lately. No. Uh, it it that group is is uh, minus the aggressive one is still wandering down around the high school. There was a call today about. One turkey that was holding up traffic. On oh, really? Yeah, they were up on my street last <laughs> week, but they were, I noticed there was no big male there. It was yeah. it looked like a lot of younger turkeys who weren't quite so troublesome. Right. Yeah. You, are, you are projecting no increase and no decrease in animal complaints. <laughs> <laughs> so. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chief. And um, next item is fire, Chief Ford. Good evening. Good evening Hi. and welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Well, I'll start off with talking about my budget and the increases, if, if that's okay, for next sure. year. Yep. Uh, we have a, a few. First off is an increase in personnel. That's mainly due to uh, step increases, educational changes. Uh, people are getting their degrees or more people, more, more firefighters are getting the EMT 
uh, certification. So that changes it. Longevity goes up a little bit, things like that, as a couple of more people hit the next plateau. So we have an increase in uh, the personnel budget by about $57,000. The services portion of my budget, which really uh, is geared towards what we have to spend on outside services on our apparatus. Uh, we've increased that this year by $10,000. Uh, we saw that last year we were uh, having a little difficulty with it. With the newer apparatus, there are more and more things that have to be sent out. We also have a problem, as you are aware, that uh, many of our apparatus can't fit into the station, so they can't always do the work in-house. So that's a budget line item for when we have to send it out to the service shop. The uh, capital portion of the budget, of the operating budget, uh, went up the most. It, it had an increase of a little over $130,000 from last year. The main reason for that is we're embarking on a three-year replacement program for our SCBA, our self-contained breathing apparatus. So that approximately, that same amount will be there for the next three years. Our apparatus that we have now, our SCBA, we actually don't, uh, purchased for the town from the DNC. And they're, uh, they're at their 10-year limit, which is two NFPA changes in safety features and things of that nature. So we'd like to update them, upgrade them, and that's what that uh, change is for. And, and those pretty much cover the increases in, in the budget for next year. Some of the, if you look at the workload indicators that we we put together. There are a few changes, and I'd like to discuss them if I could. So We've always I had the uh, response time. I'm going to skip a few of the box alarms, th still alarms. Are, they are what they are. They've gone down a little bit this year. We've had a, a, a downward trend in our calls. The average response time, well, we do a very good job on our response time. The NFPA uh, minimum standard is 90% uh, of your runs in four minutes. We're doing about 94% of our runs. But we've also noticed we had a little glitch in our reporting times actually not in our favor. So we've put a new policy in place to give us a more accurate time of our actual response. Uh, so next year we should actually see an increase in, uh, or a decrease in the time, the average time to respond to scenes. Does that mean the time you arrive? The response time is the time from when your wheels start to turn until they stop. Okay. In the station, there is also a dispatch time, also called a turnout time. There's a time from the dispatch to take their phone call and get us the information. Then there's a time frame for my men to receive that information and get dressed and get on board the apparatus and start to roll. And then there is the four minute response time of, of once they roll to when they get there. So what's the average? Someone calls and says, uh, you know, they, there's a medical emergency or something. It, it's on the four minutes. It says here the, three, three, three right, forty-eight. I'm, I'm asking when they call the dispatch. When they call nine one one, there's I, a there's a what's the time for that part of it from dispatch to you guys? To us leaving or to us getting on the scene? To you leaving the station. I, I don't have that number. That, that, I can get that number, but that's not something that I normally would, would have spelled out. The NFPA really deals on my end with the right. response time. That's the big pressure we always get put on us. But our dispatch time for when they receive the call to when they notify the firefighters in the station, uh -huh. I can certainly find that out. Well, I, I know it's want, quite I mean, You quicker. and Chief O'Leary kind of jointly um, monitor the, the dispatch people. Right? Yes. Correct. So, so what measurements do you use to make sure they're doing their job uh, as well, best they can? Those calls are monitored. We have a supervisor there uh, who, who works the reg a regular day shift. So those calls are monitored as to when they come in. Everything is time stamped. Mm -hmm. So what we do see these in our reports. I can run a report and see exactly what time the call came in and which, what time was dispatched. That hasn't been a concern. We haven't had any problems on that end. I, I, I'm sorry to keep on this, but I do, did have a question, and it seems appropriate to ask it now. How, how many of your calls are false? I know that there was a time, at least, when there were, um, let's just say, people doing, uh, particularly with the boxes, uh, a certain amount of, of um, 
there's false calls. Yeah. I, I have that number mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a broader report that I put together. Yeah. I don't have that number with me. Okay. Do you have any can, sense we, about it, though? Then uh, That's okay. I, I mean, you've I, got I really the information don't, you can answer. Because we break it down into many categories. Yeah. We put together this report, and it goes by our, our incident reporting system. Mm -hmm. And we break down hazardous materials, vegetation calls, emergency extrications, uh, medical emergencies, box well, alarms, I guess alarms. I'm going to be more, uh, maybe, maybe I can help you a little bit. When you say medical emergencies here, these are actual medical emergencies. So, well, those are how many times that we get dispatched to a medical, a call for medical emergency. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that, that we don't get there one. and they refuse treatment. Yeah, okay. But f I can say for the most part, medical emergencies usually end up in a transport. Okay. But there are times we go to a house, we might also go and, and the medical emergency is just to assist someone maybe getting back in bed or something right. of that nature or they fell on the ground we pick them up basically dust them off do a little first aid and they don't need to go to the hospital right okay thank you uh, continuing on these uh, indicators again th this was uh, mr. Kleckner got us together and asked us to try and come up with some uh, indicators that might help us give you an indication next year of some of the things that we do We've always had a large loss category, but what we're going to do now is a medium loss to give you an idea on uh, other fires that we go to that don't get out of hand and, and aren't large, but that we still go to. And I'm going to address that in a couple of minutes further. Uh, the six plus unit inspections, we've had a total of 517. Uh, that's an indicator that we, we have had, but we've also added this year lodging houses 26F smoke and uh, CO inspectors, inspections, restaurant certificate of occupancies. Those are all new workload indicators. So next year you'll get a feel of how many of those inspections we actually go out and do every year. One of the things that I'm very happy about, and so we've added in here, is Firefighter 1-2 certifications. We haven't had these in the past. And to give you an idea what a, certif a Firefighter 1-2 certification is, all the firefighters in Brookline are trained to the level of Firefighter 1-2. They're trained in those particular skills and that knowledge necessary. Certification is really a state and national uh, validation of the achievement of the, that level of training. It is not a requirement. It has not been in the town and, and isn't, as a general rule in the state, it's not a requirement everywhere. We have made it a requirement for all our new hires to pass that. And the last seven new hires all successfully completed their certification. Prior to that, I'm not sure in the exact number, but I would venture to say there were only three or four uh, members of the department that had their certification. I'm happy to say that right now we have 40 members signed up for the upcoming state exam. And uh, certified fire instructors, we had, I believe, two. Well, right now, there are a total of 10 in the state training between a class that's being presented right here in Brookline uh, every Wednesday for five weeks, tomorrow's their third week, and another one in Waltham. So we have 10 of our firefighters in that training program to become certified fire instructors. So I think that's a, a, going to be a great asset to the department, uh, and I hope it's a real snowball effect of going down this road of certification. One of the other indicators that I, I came up with this year that I wanted to share with you is um, we're talking about holding the, build, the fire to the building of origin. Now, it's not a perfect indicator because if the fire is uh, found late or has accelerants, we could get notified and it might already be out of the building of origin. So we had, it's really not an indicator that we didn't do our job. But the reason I'm putting it there is to try and give you an idea of how many fires are stopped. And I can, I can tell you that since I've been here in Brookline, we've had quite a few fires. I'm very pleased with the uh, outcome of these fires. Just recently, we've had two high-rise fires in the town, uh, one on High Street on the seventh floor, another one, I'm sorry, I don't know the address, but it was on the ninth floor. When I brought this up in front of the advisory subcommittee, they were a little surprised. They hadn't heard about it. And I can tell you that we've had several fires, several house fires. And you don't hear about them because, realistically, the Brookline Fire Department hits them very hard, hits them quickly, and we hit them with sufficient number of manpower that we put these fires out in short order. 
and they don't become big front page fires. The, my men do an excellent job of containing these fires and putting them out quickly. So again, I'm trying to come up with a couple of indicators that maybe you'll see next year of just you know, how many fires we did hold to the building of origin. With that, moving on from the indicators, uh, one thing I would like to mention, as you are aware, we had a, a little bit of a, a tough time last year with uh, my administrative assistant, uh, her untimely leaving of the department, and she has since retired, uh, Betty Fryer. She was 52 years uh, working there. And uh, we've just recently interviewed, and our, my new administrative assistant will be starting on Monday. So we're and, looking and, forward. And, and, is this not someone who was previously in another town department? Yes, it is. Yes. Yes. We, we, we have heard from the other department. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. It wouldn't be the same without it's Betty over. there, though. The decision's made. <laughs> uh, and with that, I'd like to also move on to some of my, uh, some of the accomplishments the department has achieved over the last year, if I could. As you're aware, we hired seven new firefighters that I mentioned already. They've all passed their national certification for Firefighter 1-2. We have just started the process of hiring the next batch. They've been coming in all week, all excited and getting their applications and uh, really looking forward to the process. We responded to 94% 90, of our calls were under the four-minute mark. The NFPA minimum is 90%. That's what they want to say. We did it 94%. So we're doing very well on our response. And all of our structure fires we responded to with a full first alarm assignment within the time frame. Uh, the SAFE program, which has been in existence for quite a while, and I've just recently come before you to accept that grant for another year of SAFE funding. Uh, we did 80 classrooms of uh, kindergarten through second grade teaching, teaching the children fire safety and how to behave when there is a fire in the home. It's a, a very well-received program, and it's been proven that uh, those numbers, or th those programs have reduced the overall burns amongst children tremendously. I forget the exact number percentage, but it's, it's a huge number they've gone down over the last 20 years. This is a program the fire marshal sponsors, and he, he's, this is like his baby, and he's, he's mentioned it several times. We just had the second uh, recipient of an award here in town of a, a boy who uh, notified his family of the fire right next to Station 7 on Washington Street. And uh, so that was nice to see. I've instituted uh, biannual chief meetings was one of my goals when I came here. I think it's very important to utilize the uh, level of experience we have in our chief offices. And so we get together and, and try and talk about different issues and, and where we need to be going. Having their input is terrific and it, it helps out a lot. I, I know as a chief officer, I wanted my input to be taken, so I, I like to listen to others. Several other of our uh, programs or our uh, accomplishments that I attained, uh, one is to perform fire and life safety inspections, uh, the Fire Prevention Bureau did of 150 restaurants this year, that's new. Uh, we're going to be continuing that each and every year. And we also made a big change to our software programming this year. We trans uh, threw it over to Firehouse Software, which was a big issue. Uh, our IT person, Stan, helped out tremendously, the whole IT department in the town, and it's been a, a work in progress, but it's a much more user-friendly software for firefighters especially. And I, I'm certain it's going to help us down the road in our collection of inspection fees. We're going to be able to have those fees, or the, uh, the, the process, go right into billing, also, it's going to allow us to create a premise file where we'll have information on all these residents that we will build our own file. So when we go there uh, next time, we have information on it. We'll make everybody safer. And with that, I'd be happy to entertain any questions, unless you have none. Mm -hmm. Oh, I suspect we do. Yes, Selectman Daly. No, I actually wanted to compliment you. I noticed you'd re uh, it's something you didn't mention, but you, the job-related injuries were down by... 30%, 30 percent, which is excellent. And I know you had some money last year to put, and, and there, uh, there was some work done on the areas in the stations where they, there was some uh, fitness equipment. And so how is that going in terms of, um, I, I know you and I had talked about maybe getting some 
firefighters to be able to tr to lead others in some fitness routines and that kind of thing? We currently have two firefighters signed up for a program that's put on by the IAFF, the International Association of Firefighters. They're going to go away to this program and they will come back as certified peer fitness trainers. And they will actually attain a ne their next level, which will make them capable of certifying peer fitness trainers. We are going to seek volunteers from the rest of the department who would like to be involved, and they will become certified trainers. This year, after, after paying for that training, which is upcoming, uh, the rest of the money that you, you were instrumental in getting into the budget, we're going to spend on the first round of training equipment for each station. Next year's budget with uh, Charlie Simmons in the building department, he has some funding put in to upgrade the, the five stations, the areas themselves, whether it be lighting, floors, new walls, things of that nature. And hopefully we'll be able to get some funding to any, for any additional equipment needs. The goal is that we end up with these peer fitness trainers who can put together training programs for the group and also for individual people and offer training during the day on duty guys or off duty if they want to have their own routine designed for them. And the training is geared towards firefighters, what firefighters need, the muscle groups they need for the action we use at work. Great. So we're hoping that well, this program will, as we yeah. move forward, it will yeah. all fall into place. Great. Well, I think it's wonderful that's progressing. I, I said for many years that the, when you looked at the budget for people out on on work-related injuries, uh, a number, uh, very often it was uh, firefighters because of the heavy equipment people have to carry and so forth. And really, um, you know, I think this kind of pre preventative, I mean, it's good for the firefighters if they're not injured, and it's good for the town if they're not injured. So Absolutely. I'm happy to, happy to see that moving along. Thank you. Other questions? Selectman Benka. Yeah, um, I actually wanted to respond to Selectman Daly's questions about the total time and uh, uh, went back to the Efficiency Initiative Committee report and uh, we actually looked at this. And this is a couple of years ago, uh, but I suspect that um, the dispatch system is operating uh, the same way as it did and the turnout system is. And the um, NFPA standards are a one minute dispatch time. That's from the time that call comes in until it gets to the station. One minute for that, 95% of the time. One minute for turnout, 90% uh, of the time. Uh, and then four minutes door to door, 90% of the time. And back in 08, uh, we were under six minutes, 95% of the time, from the time the call arrived until we were on the scene. So, um, I mean, when you put the the leeway together in all of the NFPA standards, it's actually under 90, their, their standards are under 90% uh, for that six minute uh, from call to arrival, and we were over 95% from call to arrival. And I, you know, unless there's been some change, I would suspect that um, the uh, department's record is pretty much the same now. If anything, I would expect it's better since that was done as they've gotten used over the last few years to the system and operations of it and uh, people with more experience. So I would say you're quite right. We're well within the NFPA guideline. Well, thank you for the data. I, I had one friend who did this, and I've heard of some other people who try to drive themselves to the hospital when they think they're having a heart attack. And I keep saying, no, don't, don't do, do it. You know, that we, we can get you there uh, faster and, and safer. Well, it's, it's not yeah, only getting safer. you there to the, the hospital, but the um, you have the EMTs on the trucks. Exactly. Who yeah. are, you know, even before you get to the hospital, they're going to be on scene. And then you have the ambulances. With, uh, and the paramedics with the life support system. So they're going to be there um, uh, well, well before you could get yourself to the hospital. So do, I, you guys, do your guys notify the ambulance if, if you're going out to a medical call or you wait until you get there and evaluate the situation? No, no, no. They're dispatched together. When a medical call comes okay. in, uh, fire alarm dispatch, well, as an example, they may dispatch P10 and Engine 3 together to respond to that call. Yeah. 
Well, it's it's a it's a tribute to to your department, Chief, because I was once uh, a year or so ago. I was in Boston, and a a woman fell down those stone stairs right across from the state house. You know, the ones that go into the the uh, uh, common. And um, a number of people called nine one one, and I kind of stood there on the street to you know sh show the ambulance when it arrived where she was because she wasn't really visible from the street. It was over 15 minutes. Really? And it, I mean, we were a few minutes away from Mass General Hospital. Now, but did, you, did you time it or did you feel it? No, I, I actually checked. Okay, it because it feels like it's a long time. Yeah. No, I, I, I actually checked because I was s saying to people around me, wow, you know, in Brookline we would have had a response much quicker than this. Okay. Uh, other questions for the chief? Yes, Selectman Goldstein. One. I know we're not here to talk about the uh, CIP. Uh, I know you're, you're getting a new engine this year, mm -hmm. and um, I want. I to, hope to. I wanted to, add, or at least it's in the budget. Uh, I wanted to ask you though, now that you've, you know, been with us for for a full cycle and you've got familiar with our equipment, do you have any? plans to, uh, to to change the, 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 the way we use our equipment or the types of equipment that we're using? And, and are you overall satisfied with the condition of our, of our uh, wheeled equipment? Um, overall, I'm very satisfied with the condition. I do have some changes in mind that I think will provide for a better use of the equipment we have and for purchases in the future that will be more efficient and uh, more appropriate for the response areas they're going to. Mm -hmm. So, and that's in my, in my five-year capital plan, sure. I've so, made those changes. So that's, that's to come, that's not for, not for tonight then? Correct. All right. But it's, it's been thought through. <laughs> yes. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I actually do have one question about vehicle repair and mm -hmm. uh, um, sort of the long-term uh, vehicle repair issue. Uh, I know we, there, there has been some talk about the facility for that, um, and you mentioned this evening that uh, the repair facility isn't large enough for some of the trucks, or some of the new equipment. Um, and, you know, one, one issue is uh, on a, on a long-term basis, uh, individuals who are qualified in all of the specialized um, equipment that is involved in firefighting equipment and uh, I was wondering if you had thoughts about that on a, on a long-term ongoing basis and what uh, what other departments are doing uh, you know there there have been some departments that have had some serious problems with uh, uh, maintenance and repair and we're blessed with the individuals that we have now um, uh, who who are really certified in in all of the uh, the relevant areas, but uh, those people are kind of in short supply. And um, well, I have given it thought, both both for the personnel and the facilities. And I, I do have a plan that I, that I have started to put together, uh, maybe to come uh, to partial fruition for next year, uh, as far as a, a facility. As you are aware, uh, there's been a study done in the past already on a facility. Uh, I have a plan of my own that uh, would be much more financially feasible and, and would get us a, a complete physical uh, facility where we could do uh, our repairs inside with lifts. Uh, as it is now, our mechanics, even if they do a, a simple oil change on my car, they have to crawl under it. They have to crawl under some of the engines out on the street to do an oil change, which is pretty sad. And anything else, an alternator goes, they might be outside in the rain with the cab up trying to change an alternator because it can't go inside. So I do have a, a plan okay. going okay. forward for a facility. As far as uh, our mechanics, when, when they retire, uh, how we're going to replace them, I think that the goal at that point will be that we search for mechanics that already have their EVO, emergency vehicle operator certification, or EVT, emergency vehicle technicians and that they already have the appropriate certifications. There are people out there, sometimes like anything else when you're looking for a certain caliber of employee, 
you have to attach an appropriate pay to, to that. I, I don't know if, that, if what we do now would be appropriate, but I know there are people out there that we can attract that have okay. the certifications. Okay, good. Um, will we be seeing something in a future year capital budget that is different from what is in there now with respect to the facility? Yes. Okay. Preview of coming events, huh? Good. Okay. Any other questions or comments? No. Then, Chief, as you've heard before, we're just reviewing the budget and getting updates from you. Um, not voting it tonight, but we really appreciate your time and effort and especially all of the um, good progress that you're making um, in both the thinking of um, new and or perhaps more appropriate performance measures. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing how they are going to measure as we get data from another year <laughs> as we go forward. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank Good you. Night. Okay. How about building department? Mr. Bennett. Mr. Simmons. Good evening. Thank you. Um, I'm here oh. to talk about, whoops, excuse me. They oh, never come empty-handed. <laughs> <laughs> told them to wait till after we do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the building department is uh, comprised of uh, three divisions. We have uh, code enforcement, we have building uh, construction and renovation that supports the CIP and public buildings. Uh, each of these divisions is supported by administrative staff. Um, for this year's budget, we have uh, a modest uh, increase over last year. Uh, this is driven mainly by personnel. Uh, we've hired a uh, pest control or moved a pest control technician from a consultant basis to an on-staff um, um, employment. It's a part-time position. Uh, we've also um, <clears throat> increased services. Uh, by moving uh, hazardous service, um, uh, hazardous service, ha hazardous material services from the CIP to our operating budget under services. Uh, this is uh, uh, for lead paint, asbestos, mold, mildew, air quality. This is coming uh, in house uh, from the CIP to uh, um, assist uh, the crunch, the CIP crunch that uh, they're facing, and uh, we've um, uh, done that in a cooperative effort with uh, Sean. Other uh, contributing factors for services is a 2%, 2.5% uh, increase um, with respect to our repair and maintenance on the school and uh, town side. And uh, we have a cleaning contract uh, that is increased by just over $15,000. Um, additional uh, increases in personnel are attributed to uh, longevity and step increases. Um, the building department uh, has uh, had a series of accomplishments uh, over the past year and a number of changes. We saw the retirement of uh, Mike Shepard. We've hired a new inspector, uh, Mike Yanovich. We got a new uh, uh, building inspector, Mark Robodeau. And um, we're moving forward on those fronts to uh, train and, and keep those uh, people uh, uh, providing new ideas and, and new initiatives uh, you know, for the department. Um, some of our accomplishments, uh, what we've done uh, in the previous year is uh, the continue, uh, uh, completed uh, the Runkle School renovation, and we continue uh, on the um, building commissioning for that project. We completed the additions um, at the Heath School for the, with the library, the cafeteria, and uh, the classroom uh, space. Um, we completed the uh, Pierce School Amphitheater project. Um, some uh, in-house uh, building department uh, issues that we've implemented. Uh, talk about uh, ZBA decisions that are now posted uh, on the web page so people have access to. I think it dates back to 2008. We have uh, improved access for the public to view permits that have been issued uh, with respect to building, plumbing, gas, electrical, uh, so they can have access and see whether those are um, actually issued or the status of them uh, during the, the, the period of the wait process. Um, we have also tried to and work with the planning department to implement and uh, continue to enforce uh, any conditions under the zoning 
by uh, zoning uh, decisions, the conditions there. So we work together uh, with planning on, on that process. Um, essentially, they, they provide a, uh, the information containing the conditions. They then stamp that as approved, get it over to our department. We review it as well with the contractor. So there's a couple of uh, uh, checks and balances there. Um, and then that is then followed up out in the field with respect to uh, a um, compliance and, and certificate of occupancy. Um, moving forward, uh, the building department, uh, some of the objectives of what we'd like to see um, done uh, with respect to building um, on the document storage and scanning side. Um, I am uh, trying to implement a uh, process uh, for scanning uh, of uh, plans. For the most part, they would be um, new plans uh, that are submitted moving forward. It would entail the contractor's uh, cooperation through uh, some format uh, by which they would submit uh, a digital copy. Um, we can also submit or uh, take in the, uh, uh, the plans and uh, have the applicant pay a fee, at which point certain periods in the year we would then send those out to a, a, a document scanning agency and those fees would be paid uh, by the applicant and it would come out of that um, type of account. We're also um, um, continuing to um, do uh, permit tracking. Um, uh, the GOTMS system is in place. Um, it's been one of the bigger um, things I've been dealing with in my time here, just trying to uh, straighten out the data, get a better uh, input process. I've been working with IT. Uh, Dale uh, there has been very cooperative. And um, we're continuing to um, update that information, um, get it a, bit, a little bit more generalized for the inspectors. Um, uh, we're also proposing um, online permitting uh, with uh, respect to the, the GOTMS. The, the hold up there, the, the, the um, the issue uh, with geo, right now, it's not the most user-friendly on, on, the, on, the, on the back end. Um, so we're online now with electrical permits. We're hoping to bring on gas, plumbing, electrical. At this point in time, uh, there's a little bit of a delay. Although it, it's being used, it's up and down. Uh, geo has promised a new release uh, this summer. Um, at that point, uh, the whole system would be upgraded. And we're hoping that that will then increase our online permitting. This assists the department. Um, with uh, data input by the, the end user, and it would stop our, free our staff up for uh, doing other things while that uh, process is, is, uh, is ongoing. Um, we have, um, or I intend to, and try to work with the department website other than just the um, uh, checking the online permits. I want to update the department website with uh, more information, get a better idea of the processes that you have to go through, update the applications, and get uh, more information uh, out to the, the consumer on uh, construction supervisor's licenses, a home improvement contractor, the steps, the process, a, a host of information that um, could at some point um, reduce phone calls. They can just check the website. This information is kind of already there. Um, we've also worked, um, I've worked with Mike Yanovich to set up a uh, code enforcement task force. Uh, that has met periodically. This is something we want to do um, every once a month, meet with health, police, fire, this would get all the, uh, the, the enforcement agencies in one room, and we can discuss uh, the separate issues, the different issues that we each have uh, with respect to uh, enforcement, uh, illegal operations, uh, illegal apartments or units, and, and other um, uh, components uh, on the enforcement side. Um, the biggest project that we have on the horizon is the devotion to school. Um, we're working towards uh, the OPM, Owners Project Manager. I uh, will then move into the de design and uh, feasibility schematic stage, pick an architect, and, and, and move forward uh, in that regard. So um, these are some of the, uh, the, the projects uh, that we're working on, excited about, and uh, we'll try to you know, follow through on. Uh, with respect to uh, performance management, uh, we've got a couple of uh, things in there. Um, online permitting is one of them. We're about 1%, maybe 2%. That's uh, something that uh, I would like to increase um, with the help, obviously, of GEO and the IT department. I think this is something that, that can work and will work. It's just a matter of, uh, again, getting that, um, that product uh, 
a little bit more user-friendly and, and e easier. Uh, there are a number of other communities that have, not GEO, but other um, programs that are very easy to use, and we've stressed that with GEO when their new product comes out, that this is something that we're uh, you know, really uh, looking for. We also accept uh, credit card payments, obviously online. <clears throat> Those are done uh, by credit card, and then in line, someone comes at the counter, we accept credit card payments, so that uh, helps a lot some of the contractors with respect to uh, writing checks or paying cash, uh, the, the credit card services there. And then um, Charlie can speak more about uh, work orders, uh, but that's another one of the um, indicators that we're going to uh, work towards. Um, uh, one of the programs that we're working with IT on moving forward with is a, it's called School Dude, and it has a facilities maintenance program with it. And that... Um, School Dude. School Dude, yes. That's what I thought I heard. <laughs> And Charlie is can that, speak. Is uh, that Charlie? Charlie <laughs> can <laughs> speak. <laughs> Sounds like it. More details on that uh, if you need. And that would help with our, our work orders. Uh, it'll um, assist in, uh, we're trying to uh, monitor uh, the, the time that we get a work order uh, done and completed. Uh, each of these um, programs, including the, the GOTMS, is one of the things I'd left out. GOTMS as well as school do does come with these um, handheld devices that again will assist uh, the inspector or the tradesman out in the field that um, they don't have to come back to the office and enter any data. They can do it right um, in the field while they are uh, performing the inspection or doing the task and that will get entered uh, much quicker and it, uh, it's a more efficient uh, process. It doesn't require them to come back and visit the town hall. We have computers set up at uh, Tradesman and, and Charlie's under the uh, department, and then out in the um, their uh, facility out at uh, Los I don't know if Charlie wants to add. On the other side of the building department, um, my accomplishments primarily went around energy and classroom space. Last year, I was told by Peter Rowe that we had a, another anticipated huge increase coming, especially in the kindergartens, we created classroom space at Baker, Driscoll, Devotion, the high school, and the Pierce, and we just fit them in. So we did well this year. And um, as of today, the enrollment numbers are a little lower than last year. They're still very high. And I will continue to work with the school department in planning their space, whether that's modulars or the old Lincoln or finding space that we already have. But it is becoming more and more difficult with the buildings that we do have. There's just not enough space anymore. Uh, a second thing is, is energy conservation. We had been doing a lot with electricity. That's where we save most of our money and get most of our money back. Recently, I started working with the gas company. And I've been installing condensing gas boilers. These boilers run about 98% efficient. Instead of removing the equipment that we already have, which is somewhat new, I had a smaller boiler, a gas boiler, and that's the lee boiler. And we run most, if not all, the time on the lee boiler, and then if it gets really, really cold, the larger boilers kick in. We've been averaging five to ten thousand dollars back in rebates from the gas company. We put them in at the town hall, the health department, the New Lincoln and the Lawrence, the police station, and we just turned the main library and the Coolidge, Coolidge Corner Library on. Um, they work great. Once we get them started, they never seem to fail. And I will continue doing that. The uh, gas rebate program will continue another year. That's good. So I'm looking at more schools, Pierce and Baker. On electricity rebates, we did get a lot of money back, twenty to $30,000 back from NSTAR last year. We continue to get a lot more money back. We've been doing work with outside lighting. And I can say that we've been sometimes through schools and town buildings two and three times and they come back with another program and they offer us more money to do new ballast, new lights. So we will continue to do that. Um, if you look at what we are using for electricity, kilowatts and what we're using for gas, it's almost constant. There was a, there was a dip because the Runkle School went online and then Runkle came back online. The Runkle School is about doubled in size. We added an addition onto the Heath. And I've been building classroom space that wasn't used and adding air conditioning and computers and so on for five years so far. Our electricity, is, for the most part, has not gone up. So this constant, constant pushing down of our 
usage and keeping it at bay is something that we have to continue to do. And uh, you know, with the help of the Selectman's Office and purchasing, we've been able to get great contracts for gas and electricity. So we'll continue to do that as we go forward. As, uh, as Dan was mentioning, um, I have about 10 in-house tradesmen that do all of the small work in the 80 buildings that we have in town. And that would be a light switch or something like a toilet. And I subcontract out all the larger work. And I monitor that with a program called Cartograph. Cartograph was chosen many years ago because it, it was a facilities program that could take care of issues with DPW and the building department and, and other departments. And over the time, it's it's it hasn't really worked well enough for the building department. It's more of a, a fleet maintenance program, more of a street program. It, it answers all my issues, but um, we had come across other programs. One of them in particular is called School Dude that's more written towards facility maintenance. And the name School Dude comes, there's another program, it's called Facility Dude, which does town buildings. You purchase School Dude. It's, it's geared specifically towards public buildings. It has built-in energy monitoring programs. It has built-in scheduling for the school department so they can schedule after, uh, after our programs and then they know how much money they're going to get back and then automatically it comes to us so we can schedule the energy management systems. It provides more real-time data on the hours and the time that the tradesmen do the work, where they're doing the work, and they can go on with, with handheld devices, get their work orders, do the work orders and download them. No more paper. And that'll increase efficiency much better. I'm trying to get, this has always been my goal, to get work done as fast as possible. And I think with this program I can stay, not that my staff is lazy or they don't do the work, but to stay more on top of them and push and push to get the, uh, the work done quicker. Um, we do about well over 4,000 work orders a year. And I have a really good staff. The work orders continue to come, and I don't see them going down anywhere in the near future, but I think a program like this will help out in um, making us do even more work orders in a year. So, uh, with that, I'm open to questions, or Dan is. Well, <clears throat> um, you want to begin with Mr. Bennett or whatever, Selectman Daly? Well, I have a question, and this might be for Charlie. It's about the ha hazardous materials services. Mm -hmm. Is that, um, it's, it's, it's going to be the increases in services, so you're still hiring outside people to do the higher hazardous yes. removal. So they're still, they're well-trained and, and yes. so on. Yes. Okay. So we're not trying to do that ourselves. I do have some people in-house. They have lead paint licenses and mold certificates and uh, asbestos licenses. And I use those for emergency jobs that pop up, but most of it is subcontracted out. Okay. And I have another question, which I think is for uh, Commissioner Bennett. Um, we talked at, this is a, a number of years ago, so when I first joined this board, so it's uh, a couple of, you know, even prior to Mr. Shepard. Um, but there, at that time we were uh, thinking that it would be nice someday if we could have, you know, some projects, um, if, if somebody uh, comes in with a project um, and sometimes, it, you know, there's, people in planning that have to sign off on it and pe perhaps preservation has to sign off on it and so and so and sometimes things were sh slipping a little between the cracks as it moved from one area to another and we were saying it would be nice as things got more computerized <laughs> if there would be a, you know a sheet and you could see who had signed off and who hadn't and, and where the gaps were is that is that part of your stuff that you have now? Uh, yes, GOTMS has that capability. Um, it's used by some of the departments. So when we log on to a project, a project would get set up for a, a new single family dwelling or a new um, commercial building. And in that you can find out what department has acted on an application. So um, fire is on there you know, quite mm -hmm. often. Planning does it for some of their um, pieces of uh, jurisdiction, but not all of it. Uh, preservation is working on setting that up. Health department is, is on that. So um, some of the departments are there. Uh, it's not to its 100% full capability, but it's gradually, uh, we're bringing that online. Uh, from the land use side, 
to try to get those sign off so that we know uh, who's acted on it, who hasn't seen it. It still requires that people still will bring in a hard copy. They, they still have to visit each of those departments and, and get the uh, appropriate approvals, but um, that capability is there and we're working on uh, making that. Uh, okay. Can, can I follow up a little bit? You, you mentioned earlier that you were um, going to do um, scanning of documents. And I, in another conversation, I've heard that there may be, and I, I'm guessing this is not going to be as true of the kinds of things you're talking about. I'm assuming if you have to send them out, they're large, right? They're drawings? The, the, yes, the ones I'm talking about now are, are mostly plans. Plans, right. Yes. Um, but I, I have understood that there may be a matter or an issue of, and, and this would not have to do with the plans, it would have to do with other types of documents where the uh, different departments are scanning the same document and therefore there's kind of a, I don't know what to call it, a data crunch um, because of the number of scanned documents, one, just the volume, and second, because some are multiple versions of the same document. And since I know we are, this may be something Melissa's have an insight into as well, I know we are trying to use less paper. And I guess I'm going to throw out another thing that um, Charlie will know, but probably nobody else. And there was a, uh, an early uh, electronic data management system called Permits Plus. I think it was before Cartograph and certainly before whoever the dude is. Um, and uh, each one of these seems to have presented its own version of, um, I'm going to call it lack of universal utility, if I can put it that way. What I'm trying to say is, in all of this, do we feel that there is ever going to be one data set that all of the departments can use so that as an ob, um, a, a request, and I know people come to you first, which is part of why I'm really interested in your thoughts. Um, somebody wants to do a project and they're coming to the building department and you say, go away, and you send them someplace else. And, and they go to planning, they go to preservation, um, they might have some other places they have to stop. But my question really is, do we have a system in place now that is, in a, in a way, I'm, I'm restating in a much more lengthy way what Selectman Daly was saying, do we know that A, the applicant is getting a reasonably efficient way of moving around, and B, do each of the departments who have a sign-off have all of the information? I mean, could I just call it up on my computer if I was one of the people sitting in the building department to find out where it was in the planning process, whether it required uh, some sort of historic sign-off? Can you do that? For, for some, some of the uh, projects, but not all of them. And we're working towards trying to get all those there. So you can you can go on to the GOTMS, uh, which is the permit tracking uh, yes. component uh, for the land use departments, and you can find out if fire department has issued a permit for smoke detectors, for fire alarm, or, or what have you. You can go to Board of Health and see on their um, uh, in their uh, line that right. they have uh, reviewed or looked at uh, a plan. Um, planning is coming on uh, slowly, so some of the things are there. They've got uh, A&R plans, some subdivision plans. We're trying to move forward with um, with some of the uh, approved, um, the, with the conditions from the Zoning Board of Appeals. They typically would stamp a set of plans and, and, and sign those as approved. We're trying to get that process um, into the GOTMS uh, system uh, that would go with the zoning and with their approval process and have everything kind of line up. At this point, we're, we're moving towards it, but we're not, we're not there uh, yet. Let's use a licensing example because that's, I think, fairly straightforward. Let's just say somebody wants to uh, have a new restaurant. So we know we've got building and health and uh, zoning and fire 
Anybody else? It's all the code people, right? Select police sometimes, yes. Well, and the selectman's office, of course. But. No, no, well, Brenda needs the plan. You're right, you're right. Um, are, are you able then to track one of those applications now? On the licensing side, I have not uh, looked at that. I know we have some of the staff has access to that, but I don't believe all. That's something that I want to talk to Dale because when we were doing these uh, certificates and the right, renewals, right, um, right. and when Brenda sent, sent some of the, the information down, uh, that is something that they said we should be able to do. I have not been able to do it yet from, from my uh, computer. I think some others in town have. So it's either the way it's set up or some of the, uh, there could be a glitch in the system that hasn't been connected. So let's just say, all right, you can't, you can't access it. Do you go then to the IT people and say, unlock me or open yeah. my... Yes. You know, give me a password or whatever it takes. Yes, Dale is the person that our, our, our go-to guy for GOT uh -huh. okay. over at the IT. So, and he's helpful. He's he's there quite a bit. Um, again, what I've really been focusing on, and I, I will spread that out further uh, uh, down the road, is I'm trying to just clean up the existing building permit mm -hmm. that they've mm -hmm. been using for roughly two years and try to get that uh, that data a little bit better organized with respect to. Uh, permits, some of the work categories, there's a host of little uh, drop downs that have been added on to and um, misspelled and we're working uh, uh -huh. diligently to straighten all that out sure. uh, on, the, on the other side through the certificate of inspections or the, um, the what they call it, the code enforcement, mm -hmm. uh, same thing, tr trying to clean up that data, contractors uh, data, some of that. So when you times. sit down with the monthly code enforcement folks, do you ever talk about your data issues? A little bit, yes. I mean, the well, most maybe one day you should invite IT to a <laughs> meeting, <laughs> we can. get the them most, to solve it for you. The most common, uh, the snow, you know, tickets is something right. that everybody is kind of on because of the uh, the way that the, the, the uh, town is divided into the di different district. That works actually um, pretty well, and if we can get all the components permitting to that uh, level. Good. I'm glad you got something you think is working. Slackman Goldstein. Thanks. Uh, shifting gears here, I, I want to hear more about the plan to bring pest control in-house. Uh, what's driving it? What are the uh, benefits that we're expecting? And what are the cost implications? There's been a bid for pest control since I've been here 20 years. It goes out every three years. The companies come in. The bid is about 40, 45,000. And they do a great job in the beginning. Hit all the buildings. Over time. By the way, let me stop you there. We're talking about buildings here. We're not yes. talking about open spaces or streets or. Uh, a little bit. It's turkeys. parks department. Not, not turkeys. No, <laughs> no, but there might be pests in a park or bees in a park where that would come in. That would cover. Okay. Yeah. And we're talking rodents and insects. And yes. And as I said, they, they diminish. They, they've quote a fixed price, and they hit it hard in the beginning, and then you don't see them after a while. And it's a constant struggle. Um, bringing them back in, meetings with the health department. They don't visit the site. They don't visit the site properly. So I had an idea that maybe we should do it in-house. I get a better response. And I could do it uh, with a person part-time that had a license, and I'd get better get better results. The cost is about half. Really? Yes. So, so, so. So because, you're, because you're hiring part-timers, is that? I'm hiring one, yeah. I'm hiring in-house part-time people, yeah. And you're, and you're hiring how many? Uh, the plan was two, but I'm actually going to be hiring one. I have one right now, and yeah. I'm going to keep it that way, and it's working. So. And uh, do we need to provide them with supplies and tools as part of that too? There's, there's, uh, there's ladders, minimal tools. Some, because of the uh, IPM plans, we're not allowed to use poison in schools, so we're very limited in what we can do. Mm -hmm. But there are treatments that we, we do purchase. The, um, the person works two hours a day, five days a week, and it addresses every building that's on the list is about 40 buildings. The high school gets addressed every week uh, because it's highly used. And we meet uh, by state law, there's an IPM plan in every school. That person has to go and check it, make sure we monitor and everything. And that's being done. The 
Net result, it, it, as I said, is, is about a $20,000 savings, and that person is going to every building, and the complaints go down. Now, what was suggested to me is I use the same model that I do for the rest of the tradesmen, the rest of the repairs. That model is I have, I have a plumber on staff. If that plumber calls in sick or there's too many jobs, I subcontract out. So if I get into a situation where something got out of control, I have other pest control companies on the state contract that I could pull them in one time, eradicate the problem, and we'll get back on track. Mm -hmm. It's not going to cost $20,000, though, to do that. Right. So. All right. Um, do we have to provide a vehicle for these uh, in-house people? Uh, I have a used pool vehicle. It's a, a Ford <laughs> Escort van that works well because that's what he needs. folds the seat down the back, and he puts his tools in, and everything's fine. Sounds like we're ready to roll this out. Yes. Uh, I mean, yeah. Good. Thank you. Selectman Daly. Yeah, um, and just to get back for a minute, you said you're not allowed to use poison in the schools. I know I know the high schools had a long standing big mouse problem. Mouse. So what what can you use? You can trap. Um, uh -huh. and you, you put down monitoring stations, they stick to that. And if if there is a time period where the children are gonna be away for five days, which is the summer or a vacation. You can do the next step and use poisons. We don't like to do that because they die in the walls. And yeah. It makes an awful odor. So the best thing to do is pull them out. If you stay on top of it, it won't get out of hand. The problem I've had in the past is we don't get response, and they multiply very, very quickly. So we get issues. Um, right now I can say there's very, very limited problems that we have, and we're on top of them. And, and you guys are also looking for uh, storage and shop space? I've always been looking for a shop for the tradesmen. We haven't really had a dedicated shop. So we, a number of years ago, we sort of invaded a couple of buildings up at the Lars Anderson, and we fixed them up. It's very tight, and we store some materials inside. We don't put the vehicles inside. And we, I need a, a central location, because they're way over in Lars Anderson, I'm over here. I was looking for a DPW building or something. It's my, still my goal. We worked with the DPW to try and get some space over there when Andy was going to renovate it. It wasn't going to work. It wasn't going to be cost effective. So I'm going to continue to work on that. I don't know if I'll get results. But the go new golf course maintenance building? <laughs> yes, Sorry. That, 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 oh, was that wouldn't be any closer. <laughs> well, it was looked at, but it's 93A property, and I, I can't go on there. Oh. I did try. Slightman Baker. Yeah, um, the traps that animals stick to, <laughs> uh, I actually think are an issue. Okay. Um, and um, you know, you might have a chat with the uh, uh, animal rights and animal cruelty people at the high school um, okay. about the use of those. They're officially called monitoring stations, and they're designed to catch anything. And it's mostly ants, mice happen to walk across it. They might stick, they might not stick. Yeah. So it, it can happen occasionally. I guess I agree with you, but we need to. What, what is the correct way to do it? Well, no, I mean, there are the traps that snap and, and kill the. Uh, the mouse instantaneously as opposed to the traps that basically stick their feet and then you know you have animals that are alive trying to struggling get off. yeah we we do use snap traps but I don't want any chance that a child can get to them so we have to put them in like a hole in a wall or we have to put them on a Friday and pick them up on Monday whereas you can take these smaller pads and slide them in areas and if someone did touch it it's just sticky we haven't had any trouble with snap traps, but I'm just concerned. Yeah, no, I mean, we were talking about the high school. High school, yes. I mean, we're oh. not talking about kindergarten. Yeah, I, I don't know. I can see high school kids well, uh, snapping their friends. Yes, right, or having something. fun with uh, snap traps. Uh, there's the, there's the beep program along the left side of the building. There's about oh, five yeah. classrooms, six classrooms, younger yeah, kids. But. Okay, any more questions for building? No, no. I just do want to say that I and I think I've mentioned this. I don't know whether you've always been here, but uh, we really do appreciate your vigorously going after all these rebates. You you've done a great job with the energy conservation stuff and and really gotten some a significant 
amount of the rebate money back, and we have we have noticed your efforts and appreciate it. Well, and I would like to even further say that every time I enter a dark staircase, I am confident that if I go down two steps, some light will come on. Light will come on. Thank you. Wait a second before you take those first steps, uh, right. and it'll go on. I did forget to mention one thing. We did get $100,000 in FEMA money, and I wanted to thank Melissa Goff for that. That was the March storms oh, two yeah, or three years right. ago. It took that long. She's been very persistent. Good. And uh, it was for the main library, the damage right. to the main library. So. Fantastic. Um, one last thing, Charlie, before you go, and that is um, the fact that we know the Devotion School is going to be the next big public project. Is there anything else that you're aware of that has that magnitude in the pipeline? In other words, that would, that uh, I, I know we're dealing with the classroom issue, um, and I'm sure when we get to the CIP, we're going to discuss what, in fact, we need to do at Old Lincoln. But my, my question is, are there other things of, on that order of magnitude that are kind of flowing down the pipeline? The only thing I can see is the high school. The high school, right. That would be the other one. Okay, so devotion, which is moving ahead. Lincoln, which will probably be the next, and then the high school would be the three. That doesn't ex yeah. you know, exclude a possible, the normal, yeah, yeah, the normal stuff coming up. Yeah, but I, right. Uh, Hundred million dollar renovation. Right. It'll right. probably be the high school, be the next big one. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. I believe the final budget for consideration is select men. I'm going to take this one on and then ask Melissa to, to help. So maybe Melissa, you could uh, come to the podium. Um, <clears throat> I'll make some just general comments and. Uh, the interesting thing about this budget, of course, is that it really serves a dual purpose or a dual nature. One is um, it, it is the selectmen's budget, so we support this budget supports the, the uh, management and the operation of the Board of Selectmen, which is the chief elected policy board, and has a lot of town-wide focus and initiatives. And then it also is the town administrator's budget, which um, manages a lot of the, um, the internal uh, operations and affairs of the, of the town town's uh, government organization. So it's it's really a, a dual type of a budget. And as a result, you'll see a lot of town-wide initiatives, accomplishments, objectives, and also some internal ones. Um, overall, the budget is increasing by $13,442, which represents about a 2.1% increase over the prior year. Of that amount, about half, half of it is reflected in required step and longevity increases for eligible staff. The other half uh, relates to increased costs for uh, credit card transactions, which uh, we are, our selectmen's office is um, going to be embarking on um, transitioning to more online uh, transactions, hopefully, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, in terms of our accomplishments, uh, as I mentioned, there are many uh, town-wide accomplishments that are incorporated within, within our, our budget. Uh, and some smaller ones, but I wanted to, to just mention real quickly a couple of ones that we were very proud of. Uh, of course, we've retained our AAA bond rating, which has not been an easy task given the nature of the uh, economy and also the uh, scrutiny that Moody's has uh, put us under given the federal budget uh, crisis that's been going on. And also, i um, uh, been very pleased that we were able to hire uh, replacement for our building commissioner and our comptroller over the past year, and I, I'm very pleased with the, the outcome of that, that process. Um, in terms of the internal operations, I wanted to ask Melissa Goff if she could go over uh, an accomplishment uh, relating to our agenda management uh, software, which you may see, uh, you may not see totally the, uh, the benefits of that, and I wanted to make sure you did. Okay, um, so as the building department was kind of ratcheting off their, their technology initiatives, I started writing down kind of what, what we've been doing and what we're aiming to do. And it's kind of amazing how much technology we've thrown at Kate and Patty and Brenda, and they've really done a great job embracing it. Um, for GOTMS, um, we're looking to, to roll out credit cards next year. We're also looking to put some of our applications online as well. Uh, we've done some cross-training so that when people come to the counter of Brenda's at lunch, you know, we'll be able to answer more questions that way. Um, you're familiar with the way that the packet gets distributed now with the agenda management system, SIRE. Um, it's also coordinated with the minutes that Kate produces, and then if you look online, you can see the, the all three components of 
the agenda, the minutes, and then the packet that you receive as well, which is really helpful to inform the public as to what's going on. And just internally, in terms of trying to find a vote and researching, it's been really helpful. It's a really robust search engine, which is great. Um, I know we've also been looking at uh, Kate and Patty and Pat Ward and I, we've been looking at a, a new way to help manage boards and commissions. So that's something else that we're working with IT on to try and improve that system and help us track it a little better and all the requirements of these boards and commissions. I'm not sure what that noise is. Um, I'm also interested. <laughs> so it's school dude. Well, uh, that was my next point too because I'm also very interested in school dude from a utility tracking perspective. There are a lot of great um, reporting out of that system and I think it would also be an easier way for um, departments to report their usage to me. Um, and then also with IT and HR, just looking at um, improving the, the dashboard with performance measurement and kind of um, looking towards the next steps of our, our performance measurement project. So, Thank you, Melissa. Uh, and then I'll just briefly get through the rest and we'll open up to questions. Um, in terms of objectives, um, I, I think our biggest objective uh, for the next year will be to roll out this uh, this online uh, licensing and other um, uh, transactions with our department, and uh, Melissa mentioned that. Um, and also, uh, in this budget, I've mentioned a lot about open government and performance management, and most, for the most part, it's done at the department level, but one of the initiatives we are going to pursue next year is participation in the National Citizen Survey, and that actually, the funding is, is incorporated within our and our selectmen's budget. The National Citizen Survey is a uh, tool that many uh, cities and towns across the country have been using, and it's already tested in terms of its validity for statistical purposes. Um, and it also allows you to measure yourself against the same um, community, those communities that participate in it. Uh, locally, Needham and Andover have done it, or at least in Massachusetts, and they've been very satisfied with it. So we're going to give it a try for next year. Uh, and with that, we're open up to questions. Uh, myself, Melissa, Sean. I mean, uh, I actually want to say something that I forgot to say while the um, building commissioner and Charlie Simmons were here, and that is that I um, today was looking at a um, the I think it's called Architecture Boston uh, publication, and it uh, mentioned recent uh, school projects and talked about uh, was talking about sort of what people are um, recommending as uh, examples, and the Runkle School renovation was mentioned. So I just sort of thought Thank it would you. be nice to comment on that. But it has to do with all of the things we've been talking about. It's like been daily. Yeah, no, so I just want to say, uh, you know, since I've recently been going through parts of it and we're talking about the efforts of, of your staff that uh, – once again, Melissa and Sean did a, a great job on the book. I think it I, continues to improve each year in terms of the explanations of, you know, what's going on and where the money's going. So thank you very much. And gets a Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. Mm -hmm. I have no uh, questions. Oh, all right. Slackman Banka? Yeah, I, well, I actually have a, a general question about the, um, uh, allocation of benefits to various departments. And um, this actually follows up on Selectman Daly's mm -hmm. question. Um, but earlier? Er, the earlier yeah. question, uh, just, um, and I think it was in the discussion of the town clerk budget, yep. as I recall. Um, the um, uh, relationship between the benefit line and the personnel line is all over the map. Uh, from department to department, and I was just curious as to how you're doing that allocation in 25 words or less. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of it is looking at the actual from last year and then projecting that forward, um, and then also just looking at what the, the current level of personnel is, and then, you know, in terms of workers' comp claims over the prior year and things like that. Okay. So, so it's, it's based on, basically based year. on the prior year and then built from that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Seems fair. Um, any other questions about the Selectman's budget? 
Seeing and hearing none, I say. I think just as a matter oops. of principle, we should increase our food. Part Absolutely, <laughs> we need to have an increased allowance for food. Um, I just would like to second or concur with all the comments that have been made about the presentation of the financial plan and um, the hard work that we know that everybody does in order to gather all of this information. I mean, when you see it, it's a great huge document, but I know there are hours and hours and hours of uh, staff time, particularly Melissa and Sean, um, that have gone into putting this together, and I just would like to say how much we appreciate it, and it deserves to be given an award. So there. All right, I believe now we will conclude the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, the 12th of March, and I'm uh, sorry for anybody who was following the agenda, the calendar, we have postponed the last item, uh, Board and Commission appointments. We'll schedule it for a, a later meeting. And that concludes the business of the Board of Selectmen for Tuesday, March 12th.